Right, okay, I think we're ready to start. So thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Mariella Cohen, I'm the TUC's Senior International Officer, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this TUC L7 event with the support of TUAC entitled Building Back a Better World. We have a fantastic series of panels coming up and we're really lucky to have such an array of distinguished international speakers to share their insights and experience on how economics and institutions can work for labor. The program is being posted in the chat and following our introductory speaker, we will go straight into the first panel um, and just to let you know, there will be a comfort break just before three o'clock UK time ahead of the plenary. This year, as the G7 meets, we are working with our sisters and brothers in the global labor movement to ensure that our members' voices are heard. As workers and their families have endured decades of worsening conditions and now confront a climate emergency and increasingly nationalist politics, this event is about exploring what a labor internationalism that brings about the structural change needed to address inequality could look like what we need to do to make that happen, and how we can create a system that instead of favoring wealthy elites, supports working people. So I'm delighted to introduce our opening speaker, Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO, which represents 12.5 million workers in the US and are at the forefront of defending workers' rights. Rich is a close friend of the TUC. We've worked closely for many years. He's an outspoken advocate for social and economic justice. And we're really delighted that he's here to open our event. So thank you, Rich. I know it's early where you are um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and let me say hello, everyone. It's an honor to join this conference. Uh, and before I begin, I want to acknowledge General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, my dear friend, Francis O'Grady, uh, Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Annie Elise Dodds, uh, Heather Boucher, a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, uh, and all the speakers and participants from around the world. Oceans and borders may separate us, but common causes unite us and may be more right now than ever before. See, we are as one global community and one global labor movement in the second year of fighting the coronavirus. It's a global crisis where working people, healthcare workers, transportation workers, retail workers, and food processing workers have been exposed to great dangers. But working people are also seen in a new light. Our work is essential. We're not disposable. People see us now. But COVID-19 is the greatest test that we face globally since the Second World War. And the question is the same now as it was then. What kind of world will follow? Can we build in the world of Britain's great prime minister, Clement Attlee, a world fit for heroes. But before addressing this, I must note how grave our losses have been. This week, the United Kingdom mourns the passing of Prince Philip, a man who actually fought in some of World War II's most desperate battles. His death comes at a time when we are really no strangers to grief. In the United States, we've lost over 560,000 souls. That's greater than all the losses from World War I, World War II, and our Civil War combined. See, throughout all of our countries, there are countless more suffering from long haul symptoms, conditions that leave us short of breath or with muscle ailments that limit our mobility and chances of returning to full-time work. If we are to bring this tidal wave of suffering to an end, we have to begin by understanding something that should be obvious. COVID-19 will only be defeated when it is extinguished globally. So we must all stand together in this moment as one global labor movement. The threat is not just the respreading of the existing disease. It's the risk of mutations, mutations that conceivably are vaccines not 
might not be effective against. So this, in addition to the simple justice of the issue, is why the global labor movement has made the vaccination of all humanity our key objective. And we will not let up until that is our reality. And second, we must protect the health and safety of our frontline workers all over the world. This is why the US labor movement was so encouraged by the Biden administration's commitment to issuing a strong emergency safety standard to protect American workers from the infectious disease and why working people so badly needed one immediately. It's why we believe multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the IMF need to make worker safety and health a metric for their funding and reopening decisions. They need to support critical initiatives like funding for a global social protection fund. And the urgency of these steps is even greater because the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 has been one of the most glaring examples of structural racism. Throughout the world, some government officials, both past and present, still deny the existence of these core injustices baked into our economies and societies and politics. It's 2021, and that kind of ignorant denial is deeply disturbing. And worse yet, it prevents progress. Look who lives and dies from COVID-19. The workers at the greatest risk in the United States and the in the United Kingdom are disproportionately workers of color. In the United States, most hospitalizations for Hispanic and black citizens are in the age group of 18 to 65, working age. For white citizens, most cases are in those over age 65, retirement age. And in the United Kingdom, study after study has shown that black and Asian British citizens face a higher risk of infection and hospitalization. Last year at the onset of this pandemic, we heard a common phrase, coronavirus does not discriminate. One year later, we know more. And yes, we're all susceptible to the virus, but the conditions in which we live and work are not equitable, and that matters. But the task of fighting and beating the virus is only the beginning, because the world is also enduring a profound economic crisis that requires a continuing aggressive response. We cannot afford to repeat the disastrous austerity policies that followed the 2008 financial crisis that, would, that put millions of working people on a glide path to permanent economic scarring. And make no mistake, the very survival of democracy itself is at stake. We must rebuild quickly and we do so as we do so, we must put people first, not financial institutions. And that means fulfilling the promise of providing safety and a functioning economy to everybody. We need to make sure that we create a fair taxation system. We need a minimum corporate tax that will allow us to fund critical programs and prevent a global race to the bottom. Putting everyone back to work is a necessary condition for healthy growth. Fiscal and monetary policy cannot risk being slow about making that happen or actually slow as a policy. Last month, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan. And really it's not an exaggeration to say that the American Rescue Plan is a transformative package. And the good news is it was union made. It's relief for working people, not another bailout for big banks on Wall Street. And we did not accept crumbs off the table 
the end of the table this time. Look briefly what's in there. Payroll protection to keep workers on the job and survival checks to put money in 85% of the people's pockets. Support for our states and cities and towns so that we can preserve critical public services and honor the heroes who provide them. Resources that we need to ensure that kids and our educators are safe in the classroom and so much more. It provides pension protection until 2051. And the American Rescue Plan is gonna cut child poverty in half. Studies show that US GDP will expand by 3.8% this year because of it. And the OECD says it will expand global GDP by 1% this year, increasing the GDP of other G7 countries between a quarter of a percent and a half a percent. That's huge. But given the current existential challenges, it is only a start because actions that provide relief must be followed by measures that promote recovery. And a couple of weeks ago, President Biden rolled out the American Jobs Plan at a union training facility in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The American Jobs Plan is an unprecedented federal investment in us, in working America, and in our infrastructure to create well-paying union jobs. The Protecting the Right to Organize Act, or as we call it, the PRO Act, is much needed labor law reform to our 100 year old labor laws. And it is part and parcel of the American Jobs Plan. That's how committed this White House is to the right to collectively bargain. I know you know the horror stories of what it's like to form a union in America today. The fear, the intimidation, the firings, the billion dollar, billion dollar business dedicating to destroying our rights. And the workers at Amazon in Alabama were the most recent to face this brutal onslaught, but they're really not alone. It should never, ever, ever be this hard to form a union. And with the PRO Act, it won't be. So let me be clear about one thing. Reforming our 100 year old labor laws through the PRO Act is the American labor movement's number one priority because a stronger labor movement in the United States and around the world is the answer to how we address so many challenges, including runaway inequality. And when I talk about inequality, I'm talking about the inequality of income the inequality of opportunity and the inequality of power. See, the plain truth is that global corporations are too powerful and working people across the globe are too weak. And as long as that imbalance continues, we won't be able to solve the inequality of wages or the inequality of opportunity. In America, the PRO Act is how we finally return power to working people. Look, we have to continue to act boldly because boldness is what led us out of some of our darkest chapters. You know, in the United States, our federal government paid the tuition of half the college students in school in 1948. Then it lowered the barriers to financing and education by providing low cost loans and propelled the United States to number one as the most educated workforce. In 1956, we broke ground on a 41,000 mile interstate highway system. See, it was that human capital and that infrastructure were, were the launch pad for accelerated private investment and record productivity growth for almost 40 years. And globally, collectively, we launched the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to ensure that governments could have the liquidity 
to put recovery first. Brothers and sisters, together we created a world in which governments could put the needs of working people ahead of the demands of big business. This foundation is slipping in runaway inequality and attacks on voting, in roadblocks to unionism and systematic racism, in child poverty and retirement insecurity. A democracy that does not need the needs of its people, that cannot house and feed and take care of their illnesses is not going to last long as a democracy. It's a painful lesson history has taught us way too many times. We must rebuild our global democratic infrastructure and that requires inclusive politics and inclusive economies. Unions everywhere are a necessity for democracy to take hold. We must have democratic institutions in which we come together to work on a common task and goals. And these institutions are the bulwark against ideologies that would divide us and give strength to demagogues, white supremacists, and all those who sow division for their own advancement. One global labor movement. Let's recommit ourselves to being fully inclusive. Let me tell you one last story. You know, sadly, during World War I, Black United States citizens were forced to fight in segregated units. Our 369th Infantry fought alongside the French because white Americans refused to fight with black patriots. And the 369th spent more days in combat than any other American unit. And when they returned home, they returned home to a nation that chose to double down on segregation. And the United States was hit with a wave of racism and hatred, just as the European of post-World War, World War I was hit with the wave of anti-Semitic pagrims. But at the end of World War II, President Truman laid the foundations for ending shameful segregation in our military. We as the federal policy leaders to take the side of those civil rights organizations fighting to protect our country. And our labor movement joined that fight too, ending segregation within our own ranks. And today, our movement stands with Black Lives Matter movement because divisions hurt everyone and devaluing any human, any human is a danger to all humans. That's always been the truth. And this virus reconfirms it. Each of us, starting in our own nations, must unite and organize workers to remove economic and political and social barriers. That means we simply can't return to trade agreements that make powerful corporations richer and workers weaker. We must build strong democracies and governments strong enough to endure and to work for working people because we're at a critical juncture to beat a pandemic and challenges that exist before it from inequality to racial injustice, impossible or too expensive are not phrases that we can afford. So the challenge is clear. We must rise to the moment. Let's ignore calls to simply return to pre-pandemic conditions because this is a moment that requires assessing all that went wrong in the past and then building back a better world for our future. And it means building back with unions. And that my brothers and sisters is how we build a world fit for heroes. Thank you and God bless you. Stay safe.
Thank you very much, Richard. And um, welcome everybody again from uh, my side. My name is Filip Stefanovic. I am an economic policy advisor at the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. And uh, I'm very pleased to be chairing uh, now the first session uh, of uh, on our uh, the first panel on our agenda on uh, how power imbalance and inequalities have meant uh, a failed economy. Um, now, before starting and introducing our excellent speakers, let me just share a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, for your information, this event is being recorded and you can find the uh, Trades Union Congress Code of Conduct for all events uh, posted in the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions to, uh, for the panel that is coming, and we will try to address as, as many questions of, uh, as we can in the limited time in front of us, you can post them in the chat box. You have a specific Q&A uh, box uh, function. Uh, subtitles are available. If they do not appear on screen automatically, uh, then you need to click the caption button. It's located along the bottom of the screen on the same row as the Q&A box. Um, and now let me move straight to our panelists, if they can activate their, their, their cameras. Uh, we have three excellent speakers today with us, uh, Matthew Klein, uh, Anne Pettifor, and Jeff Tilly. Matthew Klein uh, is the economics commentator at Barron's. He also wrote for Financial Times, Bloomberg, and The Economist. And he is the co-author with Michael Pettis of uh, Trade Wars Are Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. Among else, he is an expert in the history of the Federal Reserve and monetary economics. M. Pettifor is a political economist, author, and public speaker. And her latest works include The Case for the Green New Deal and The Production of Money. She's an expert on sovereign debt and international finance, well known for being among the few economists who warned about the risks of an Anglo-American financial crisis in the making well before 2008. She's director of Prime, a network of economists that promote Keynes' monetary theory and policies and focuses on the role of finance sector in the economy. And last but not least, Jeff Tilly is senior economist at the Trades Union Congress since 2014. Uh, this follows 25 years as a member of the government statistical and then economic services involved in the production and interpretation of macroeconomic statistics and the national accounts. In his book, Keynes Betrayed, he argues that Keynes' primary concern was international and domestic monetary mechanisms to avoid recession with fiscal policy to resolve recession in second place. Now, uh, for what concerns uh, our panel, uh, this session investigates what is wrong with the global economic system, why inequalities are rising, while economies were increasingly weak and fragile even before the COVID-19 virus hit us. At the first glance, our speakers tackle very different issues. Matthew will talk, will talk about international trade and why we need to look at the distribution between wages and profits in order to understand the big countries push for export-led growth models in the past decades. And, We'll talk about the Green New Deal and explain to us why we cannot address the climate emergency without first reforming our economic system, starting with finance and monetary policy. And finally, Jeff will close by telling us what he means by shifting from a globalization in terms of capital to an internationalism on the basis of labor. Underlying these different issues is a similar understanding of the main cause of our economic malaise which is power relations between wealth and labor, the need to tame the former and strengthen the latter in order to rebuild our economies better, this time for real. So without further ado, I would like to give directly the floor to Matthew Klein for uh, his first presentation. Matthew. Thank you very much, Philip, uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for uh, having me here. I really appreciate having the chance to talk about uh, the book. Um, I think it, it really relates to a lot of the themes that, that Richard was mentioning earlier, and hopefully that will be covered, you know, in the rest of this uh, discussion today. So I'm just going to have a quick few slides to give you kind of an outline of, you know, where we're coming from on this. Uh, you know, the argument we make in the book, it sounds very radical in its conclusions, and I think in some ways it's very striking, and that's why it got a lot of attention when it came out, but it, it's really based on ideas that are actually quite old and in many ways are quite simple. And what we really did that I think is, 
is novel and helpful is essentially just looking through and thinking about what the logical implications of these conclusions are and how thinkers from the past, um, you know, they understood these exact same points. So for example, what probably the, the single most important uh, person to have come up with some of these ideas earlier was the, uh, the British economist, John Hobson. And you know, his essential point was that if you want to understand why imperialism was happening um, from Western Europe to the rest of the world, you have to understand the internal dynamics of the imperialist countries and that the common stereotype that people had both then and now that the imperialist project was actually good for most people in Europe at the expense of most people in the rest of the world was wrong. That actually you have to think about it as really being an extension of the exploitative and uh, unbalanced unequal systems within the European countries and simply the consequence of those systems spreading out globally and, and the relation between domestic inequalities having international leakages. And that's that's idea he came up with well over 100 years ago. It's an idea that's based on you know the, the mechanisms that 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 he describes in, in many ways are even older than that. And uh, you know we're just really trying to update that and bring that kind of analysis into understanding the world of the late 20th and you know the past really few decades, late 20th, early 21st centuries. So so what is this happening? So I mentioned that these are very straightforward, sort of simple statements that these are the logical conclusions of. Um, well, one thing that's really important to understand is that. All spending in the world comes from other from income and credit, and all income in the world comes from other people's spending. So globally, there's no there's no concept of being able to save by accumulating you know net financial assets. Someone has to be you know creating financial assets or borrowing to make that happen, and you know that leads to you know there's nothing inherently wrong with this by the way you know when you're in your working age you're you're saving you're you're putting money away when you retire you sell your money down and pay for your retirement. The thing is that over the course of your life, most people, they end up saving essentially nothing, which is how it's supposed to be. You're smoothing out your consumption over time. But uh, there are certain entities where their behavior is systematically different. And this is why inequality or the distribution of income, the concentration of income and changes in the distribution of income have macroeconomic consequences. And so there are a lot of reasons why people care about and talk about inequality, they talk about whether it's fair, whether it creates the right set of incentives, whether it reflects, uh, you know, social, the kind of society you want to live in. That is all, those are all very interesting, worthwhile topics of discussion, but our point is actually much simpler, which is that irrespective of how you feel about the morality of the system, that it has, because people at the very, very top and institutions, entities at the very top of the income distribution have fundamentally different behavior when it comes to saving and spending than everyone else, that relatively small changes in the distribution of income have substantial macroeconomic effects. And so one way of looking at this is the, the chart on the right panel, which comes from a paper Emanuel says and Gabriel Zuckman, which essentially is saying, look, if people at the very high end of the distribution, because they earn so much more than everyone else, they cannot consume everything they're earning on goods and services. They might have very expensive taste. You can have, you know, spend millions of dollars on birthday parties every year. But if you're making a hundred million dollars a year, you're still gonna have to put the majority of that or at least a large chunk of that, that income every year in assets, whether it's financial assets like stocks, bonds, bank deposits, or whether it's real assets such as, such as property or fine art. And that ends up creating a distortion for the economy because if, if there's this sort of strong demand for assets, then the rest of society whether it's the rest of the world, whether it's governments, whether it's people lower in the income distribution, have to be creating those assets, whether it's by selling down their own wealth or realistically by by borrowing and cre or, or selling stock or things of that nature. And so one thing we've seen, it's a, it's a relationship you see in many countries, but you've seen it very strikingly using in the US data, which is the chart on the left here, which is that the increase in the share of national income that's gone to people, the very, very top of the income distribution in the United States has gone hand in hand with an increase in indebtedness by both the US government and by households. And so effectively what that means unsurprisingly is that if people at the very top are continuing to earn money and in fact earning a larger, larger share of national income, the only way that's possible is if other people are borrowing more and more to continue to spend. Uh, one way of thinking about this is that businesses as a whole cannot increase their profitability by cutting wages because globally the demand for the you know sales comes from spending by by consumers which primarily are workers so the only way that can work 
that you can have businesses maintain their sales if they're paying their workers less, is if their workers are borrowing more or if someone else is borrowing more to support consumption, which is why, again, globally, you've seen this relationship where rising income concentration, rising profitability goes hand in hand with rising government budget deficits and rising household indebtedness. Now, our book, we spent a lot of time talking about this in sort of a basic, you know, sort of this fundamental way and giving historical examples. We really focus, though, in particular on the rise of global imbalances in the past 30, 40 years and looking at sort of the three um, most important largest economies and most representative economies, China, Germany, and the United States. And this is focusing on, you know, when we look at the growth of trade surpluses, which are sort of the driving, which have been the driving force of, of global imbalances, they in, in general are consequences of shifts in economic and political power that uh, come at the expense of ordinary people, workers, retirees, so forth, and rewarding economic elites, whether it's financiers or big businesses, or in the, in the chase, case of China, you know, party officials, where there's not really sort of hard distinction between government and the private sector. <laughs> and you can see this, <clears throat> you can see this, for example, the China left in China, you can see that the share of China's economic output, everything, the value of everything that's produced in China by China's workers, by China's businesses, that actually is consumed by people who live in China has fallen quite dramatically since 1989. And you know these data only go through 2019, but we know from the data from 2020 that it's actually gotten even worse since then, that you know less than 40% of what the Chinese economy produces actually is consumed in, by people in China. And that's not because the Chinese economy is so productive that Chinese households don't need it. I mean, there's an incredible amount of poverty in China. Hundreds of millions of people in China are extremely poor. And even in, in cities, their, their living standards are much lower than they otherwise should be. The reason this has happened is because the Chinese government, the Communist Party of China, has consciously tried to redistribute income and spending power away from ordinary people and divert that to businesses and to the government to uh, for political reasons and for, and because that's what supports sort of the political economy model that was embraced after 1989. And that has had consequences primarily for Chinese people, but also for the rest of the world, because the rest of the world has served as an outlet for some of the consequences of, of this, this developed model. It, it's, it's very similar in a lot of ways to the relationship between the, you know, the working classes and owner classes and say, England or France or Germany in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, and peoples in, say, Africa or the Middle East or uh, Southeast Asia, which um, is a point that was actually first made um, about 10 years ago in a paper uh, by an economist, actually, the U.S. Treasury Department, saying that, you know, despite all the rhetoric that, that uh, you know, the Chinese state might say about, you know, Marxist-Leninism with, you know, Chinese characteristics, in many ways, really following the, um, the sort of capitalist imperialist model that was described over 100 years ago. A very different society with a very different set of political and economic institutions nevertheless experienced something similar over the past several decades, which was Germany. And then Germany ended up spreading this to Europe, the, essentially this model to the rest of Europe, which is that the trade surplus that Germany has become increasingly, the German economy has become increasingly known for is not something that's actually benefited the working people in Germany at all. And in fact, it's a direct consequence of changes in Germany that have harmed people who live in Germany. And there are a lot of ways of showing this, but I like the one that's on, on the chart on the right, which is essentially that if you look at how much money German companies are making, their profitability, you know, essentially how much is, is going to the owners, the capital, uh, whether it's stockholders or creditors of German companies, that is a direct consequence of the trade surplus. That all that all that extra money that they're making from selling more abroad than they're consuming is essentially in the aggregate German companies they cut their capital investment they cut their workers wage bills and they continue to sell uh, the goods that they sell to export and that created a wedge uh, between imports and exports that led to rising profitability for German companies that was not helpful at all for German workers but that's you know essentially you know and and that model eventually spread to the rest of Europe after the euro crisis as, as the German government thinking that they discovered something important about how best to manage an economy, so insisted that this model spread and pushed other governments elsewhere to remove social protections, to raise taxes on consumption and on labor at the expense of taxes on capital, and <clears throat> to cut public investment and led to a uh, very similar kind of dynamic uh, throughout the rest of Europe, which has had consequences uh, first for Germany's neighbors and now for the rest of the world. And finally, just you know, bringing this forward into you know, how are these these things? You know, those charts we're all talking about before the coronavirus. How has this manifested itself since then? And uh, this chart, you know, I've been updating this, you know, relative, you know, over basically over the past year. Um, one thing that's really striking, if you look at the coronavirus and the economic impact of the virus, is that initially, 
um, the economic impact is very similar across countries. You look at what happened, you know, the monthly data in the U.S. and China, for example, you can see the downturns in consumer spending and manufacturing production were basically the same between, you know, the initial start of the pandemic and the, and the nadir, you know, a month or two later. But the recoveries have been very different. You can see this if you look at the European data as well. And that reflects differences in the political and economic institutions that existed before the virus. And so what you see is that uh, the recovery in China was led primarily by industrial production, by manufacturing production, and by uh, investment in infrastructure projects, um, which, you know, in the U.S. and, and, in, and in Europe and so forth, infrastructure is being something that's socially valuable in China. It, at this point, it is less, it's much less so. Um, it's more kind of done as a way of, of sort of offsetting the economic consequences of the fact that workers have so little spending money uh, relative to what they're producing. Um, and so what we've seen is that in China, you know, there's been this massive mismatch where, in fact, despite the fact that people talk about how the Chinese government, the Chinese economy is, you know, it grew in 2020 and, oh, wow, that's such a remarkable accomplishment for, for, for China and reflects the strength of economic management. The actual level of consumer spending in China, household, which is the best proxy of household living standards, it fell in 2020. In fact, it fell more in China than it did in the United States. And in, in the United States, actually, consumption rose. Um, in China, it fell. Whereas in China, manufacturing production rose and in the US, it fell. And so unsurprisingly, this has had pretty significant consequences for global trade, where China has had uh, some of its largest trade surpluses ever in 2020, um, because exports actually rose, even though the global economy and all of the export markets shrank. But China's imports fell pretty dramatically, both because of tourism fell, but also because there was less, you know, consumers had less money in China that cut back. In the US, we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen, in fact, imports and exports both fell, but imports fell much less. And so as a consequence, you've seen a, a sharp increase in the US trade deficit, a sharp increase in China's trade surplus. And this is reflective, of course, of the fact that in China, the government focused on protecting businesses and um, not protecting households. There was no real unemployment insurance response whatsoever. In fact, you had tens of millions of migrant workers who had been in the cities and sort of a quasi, you know, quasi legally sent back to the countryside to be subsistence farmers. Whereas in the US, while the response is you know, certainly far from perfect, there, there was an important focus on preserving household incomes and giving consumers money to make sure they could maintain their own living standards. And that, you know, we can see that very clearly in, in the difference between the blue line and the and the black line here, and we can see it in a variety of other statistics. And, and you know, the extent that these these differences are um, sustained and the fact that we see this in a variety of other countries, you look at what's going on with Europe right now, Europe has had a very different response, initially had a similar response to the United States, and since had a very different one. And in fact, we're seeing that now with um, consumer spending in Europe is actually still quite low relative to where it was before the pandemic, whereas in the US it's higher. And that's going to lead to potentially some serious issues as well. So that's that's what I have for my initial talk. And I'm um, looking forward to the rest of the panel and uh, asking questions. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping that Nikki can put up my PowerPoint. <clears throat> and thank you. And that was so impressive, Matthew. Um, thank you for it. Mine is going to be much more of a political economy perspective on, on this. Uh, when when, um, when the, the PowerPoint uh, pops up. Um, but I want to begin by saying that I, I really value this particular conference, this particular event, and I value the fact that the TUC is putting the international system at the top of the agenda of this event. Because for me, uh, it becomes clear that, that for most of us on the left, those of us in trade unions or in the Labour Party, the international system is somehow obscured. And I want to see us to pay much more attention to it. So the theme of my talk is that if we want to stabilize the ecosystem, if we do want to build back better, then first we must transform the international financial system. And you may think this sounds over ambitious, but I want to show you that it's possible. Next slide, please. So I want to begin with this quote from Karl Polanyi, which is in which he says that as a, as a rule, a society does not become conscious of the true nature of the institutions under which it lives until those institutions have already passed. We're not really conscious of the international system as a system. We're very much more conscious of what's happening here domestically, what's happening on our doorsteps. And I want to show you what implications that has for policy. And next slide, please. 
So I want to argue we, we must escape from the straight jacket of the system, which as Matthew and Michael Pettis explain in their excellent book, is a straitjacket of debt fueled export led growth model uh, shaped in particular by offshore capital markets deregulation and above all rent seeking. Uh, that is the financial order that so shapes our own lives. Next slide, please. And I want to stress that this form of rentier, rentier capitalism is not something remote. Um, I just wanted to use this quote from Nicholas Caldor, who warned back in 1971 that if we adopted this international, this financial system, this would transform a nation of creative producers into a community of rentiers, increasingly living on others and seeking gratification in ever more useless consumption with all of the debilitating effects of the bread and circuses of Imperial Rome. And how right he was. And let, next slide, please. Um, but what I want to show you is that actually we all participate in this rentier economy. And I think for many on the left, for social democracy in particular, we sort of celebrate it. You know, we think globalization is a good thing. It enables us to travel far and wide to exotic places. Uh, it enables us to use the internet. We are able to use our credit cards and our debit cards all over the world. And then it gives us all of these gifts, which, you know, cheap, cheap rides on Uber, uh, we we rent music, which we stream from the internet, and we use our own properties to also uh, collect rents. And this is something that we've all participated in, or we're encouraged to participate in. It's part of our daily life. <laughs> I was looking for photos to use for for images to use for this presentation, but if I want images now. They're not freely available, for example, of the 1930s. I have to buy one from Getty for 500 quid, really, which is not affordable for someone like me. So the point is, this rent seeking of uh, is, is something, you know, that we're all participating and we're all, in a sense, upholding. And I think it's really important for the left to understand that and to uh, distance ourselves from it. Next slide, please. So the thing I want to start with is that part of our problem is that actually we've undermined the democracy, our democracy with, with the current international system. As Alan Greenspan famously said, that it really didn't matter who was elected as president of the United States ever. Uh, hardly made any difference at all, except perhaps in terms of security, he said, because the world is governed by market forces. And that is still the case. Uh, market forces decide on the value of our exchange rate. It just, uh, market forces decide on what we're going to pay in the way of interest. If we want to, for example, invest in a wind farm, market forces decide whether or not capital moves in or out of our country. Market forces decide whether or not big corporations pay their taxes or not. These are all determined by the market. And you know that it's that which in my view is something that we haven't really properly understood and haven't understood how uh, negatively it impacts on uh, the economy. Next slide, please. So this matters because uh, we're facing a major crisis, another major crisis. The pandemic is part of that crisis, which is of course um, global, uh, climate breakdown and uh, the collapse of biodiversity. And we have to somehow manage the finance that is aimed at um, fossil fuels, if we are get, as well as managing fossil fuel companies. But it's really hard to manage fossil fuels and the, and the cuts in fossil fuels if there is a source of finance which is aimed at, at, at the sector. And next slide, please, as the wonderful Rainforest Alliance have uh, shown, um, since the Paris Agreement uh, five or six years ago, the world's biggest banks have lent $3.8 trillion to fossil fuel companies, which continues to stir uh, climate chaos. So why does that happen? That happens because these banks are beyond, if you like, the regulatory democracy of which, which we are familiar with, the, the, the system of, of regulation that is part of, of, of national regulation. They, uh, these banks are, occupy a space in the stratosphere, in the globalized stratosphere, which is uh, remote from that. And so managing the, um, the finances aimed at fossil fuels is very difficult for individual states. Next slide, please. 
So I want to um, show that, and, and as Matthew said and others have shown, um, one of the consequences of this international system is the rise in inequality around the world. And I found this chart from the Federal Reserve, which was produced in March, a couple of weeks ago, absolutely extraordinary. And it's a chart which shows the growth in wealth in assets of the 1% on the one hand, and the growth in the wealth, the assets of the 50% of, 50 of the citizens of the United States. And what is extraordinary for me about this chart is that the American people are not in revolt. There isn't a revolution taking place, that only 74 million people voted, if you like, for the supposedly uh, anti-1%, anti-elitist candidate in the last election, because this imbalance, this injustice is, is huge and it's almost unprecedented. So that's one of the consequences of a system in which we allow uh, financial uh, institutions, financial corporations to operate almost without regulation. Next slide, please. It leads to global economic disorder and let's move along and to next slide, please, and to global kleptocracy, which we were hearing about. We're in the middle of a big uh, um, scandal here in Britain at the moment around green silt. And that's a global kind of, that's a, that's, a level, that's a level of corruption at global level. Next slide, please. And also there's of course, trade tensions and threat, which threaten political stability. And I don't wanna go into that. I just want to sort of point out that these are the consequences of our international system. Next slide, please. And all of that is pretty grim, really. It's a pretty grim picture, but I want to argue that there is hope. There is hope that we can transform this international financial system. And I want to argue, I know that and I feel that because we've done it in the past. And I, as mentioned, am a Keynesian and I've watched what Keynes did in 1919 after the First World War and the influence he had on Roosevelt and the impact of that, that, that um, on Roosevelt and what, it, and what it enabled Roosevelt to do when he too and the American administration faced a major climate crisis. Next slide, please. So, and I want to point to, if I may just quickly plug <laughs> the Green New Deal, which began here in 2008 in Britain. And it's often not remembered that this is where the Green New Deal originated, the whole concept of the Green New Deal. And I'm proud to say that um, Jeff Tiley, who's on this call, was a member of this group, but not named here because at the time he was at the treasury. And the key thing about the Green New Deal was that we recognized that in order to transform the climate, we had to also transform the economic system. So for, for, for us here in Britain, the Green New Deal is about those both working together that you can't have the one without the other. Next slide, please. And this is where the hope lies. Next slide. Because in it lies with, and I, wa I want here to quote Roosevelt in his inaugural uh, uh, speech uh, on, the minute, on the day he was elected, in which he attacks Wall Street very specifically, very particularly. Um, next slide, please. And in doing so, he argues correctly that faced by the failure of credit, they proposed only the lending of more money. Next slide, please. And sure enough, that's what we're seeing today as what they were seeing then in 1933. Global debt, according to the Institute of International Finance, which is reported to this week's spring meetings, shows that debt is almost 360% of global GDP, um, something like $280 trillion, which is a number almost beyond comprehension. But just think about $280 trillion of debt and just $87 trillion of global income, GDP, to get a sense of the massive imbalance that is and of the fact that this is going to, if you like, at some point, fall down. It's at some point, those debts are not going to be repaid and that will precipitate crises. Next slide. So, they, so the Roosevelt administration was faced by that crisis, but also by the high levels of debt and by the just creation of new credit by the by Wall Street, essentially. But it also faced this massive ecological crisis known as the Dust Bowl. Next slide, please. As well as unemployment, 
And next slide, as well as, of course, um, the crisis in Europe in 1931 of Bruning's austerity policies, which led to the rise of Hitler and so on. Next slide, please. So faced with all of those threats, um, and those threats were as grave as almost as the threats that we, we face today, the first thing that Roosevelt did on the night of his inauguration was to begin to dismantle the international system that is the gold standard. It didn't happen overnight. Overnight, of course, he dismantled it for the United States and, uh, and, and the role of gold in the United States economy, but it was to subsequently lead, even in that year, actually, when he refused to attend an international conference to reinstate the gold standard, it led to the dis mantling of what uh, Keynes had called the barbaric relic, relic that was the international gold standard. And that was the globalization of that day. And so really the point I'm trying to make here is that with political will, uh, uh, the leader of, uh, of, of the United States government was able to challenge the system, the international system. Uh, next slide, please. And Henry Morgenthau expressed this best when he said, we moved the financial capital, i.e. the government from London and Wall Street to my desk at the treasury. This put, next slide please, this put a democratically elected government, if you like, um, in the driving seat of the economy. Uh, here is Roosevelt in a car. He, had, he, he, he wasn't able to drive, but he was, this is the only image I've got of him sitting in a car. So that, so that a government was put into the driving seat of the economy. Next slide. And this is what then enabled uh, the Roosevelt administration to create jobs. Next slide. Uh, they recognize that work pays America. Sure enough, full employment was absolutely essential for maintaining, uh, for stabilizing the public finances. Next slide, please. But also invested in the climate uh, set up the civilian uh, conservation corps, which had problems, you know, it happened to be all white, as uh, Rich mentioned, there was still a great deal of racism then, and it also never included women, but never mind, they, well, <laughs> do mind, but what it did do was to plant four billion trees and begin to repair the health of, of the soil. Next slide, please as well as to invest in the arts. Uh, John, Steinbuch's, John Steinbeck's book was sponsored by the Roosevelt administration, the writing of it. So what we learn from this is that actually it has been possible for a political institution, for political leadership, new slide please, to actually um, transform the system with political will. But for me, the really crucial issue is that the labor movement, the trade union movement must have some understanding of the nature of the system and of the need for such a transformation and of the of the degree to which we've we've bought into it. And I just want to end with this hopeful um, point from uh, uh, Ursula Le Guin, which is the story about we live in capitalism, the power seems inescapable, so did the divine right of kings that seemed inescapable. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. And that often begins in the art of words, of language and education. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Anne. And uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, I think I shall start sharing my screen now, if this works. hope that has worked. Um, so th thank, thank you to, to both. Um, for me, my starting point is the global financial crisis, the recession, the subsequent austerity policies amounted not only to a failure of policy, but also of economic thinking. I very much like Matthew's book because he points to an alternative economics. One, as he said, was rooted not only in past thinking, but I also think past actions of the left. For me, this economics operates across three fundamental dom domains, the power relations between wealth and labor, a theory of the economic cycle as resulting from glut, not scarcity, and the interplay between the domestic and international economies. We are led to conclusions wholly at odds with orthodoxy, offering opportunity, but also danger, 
given disaster has been caused by operating the system wrongly, error can be corrected. But without correction, past errors will be exacerbated and outcomes will go from bad to worse. I'm going to use my brief remarks just to make some remarks on each of these three points and then look at some results very quickly to conclude. So Matthew brings class interest back into play as, and I quote, a conflict mainly between bankers and owners of financial wealth on one side and ordinary households on the other, between the very rich and everybody else. My sense is that this conflict is fundamental to the dynamics of a monetary economy. And this conflict can be captured empirically. The return to wealth is estimated by the rate of interest on the left, this rate of interest goes beyond the bank rate or the rate on government bonds and is proxied here by an inflation adjusted rate of interest on US corporate long term borrowing. The labour share, which is more familiar, then proxies the return to labour. Note that the time spans on the two charts differ. But for both, we see abrupt shifts in power relations. Most obviously, the balance was more towards labour between the 1930s and the 1970s, and it was towards wealth ahead of and after this episode. There is then a choice of economics to explain these shifts. According to the conventional view, the returns are preordained according to economic conditions. We hear this today. Central bankers repeatedly insist that alleged low interest rates are the consequence of a dismal outlook for growth. The rival view is that these returns simply result from power relations. From the 1980s, the Volcker shock to global interest rates and so-called financial liberalization marked the restoration of power relations that existed before the Great Depression. And in parallel, wages were attacked in the UK, most potently over the miners' strike. But a deregulation agenda also emerged from international institutions, from, for example, the OECD job study and the EU's Lisbon agenda. And this is still the world we live in. For the many, austerity policies enforced increased competitiveness and cut public sector jobs and salaries, while the few were, were rewarded by immense subsidies. On this rival view, economic outcomes are also determined by power relations. And this, for me, is where Matthew's theory of the cycle comes in. The fundamental point is that aiming the system at the few is not only unfair, it is also profoundly dysfunctional. With the balance towards the few, production becomes excessive relative to deficient purchasing power. On one hand, low wages put production out of reach of workers. On the other hand, excess wealth is constantly seeking new outlets for capital gain, fostering excesses in property, production in cutting edge technologies and in ripe for exploiting overseas economies. And then private debt is inherent to the process as firms are unable to meet desired sales and households are unable to afford a basic standard of living. Eventually the system caves in. The first was localized, e.g. towards the end of the last century, in Japan, Germany, Scandinavia and Southeast Asia. It then culminated in the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. It is vital, I think, to recognize that this diagnosis is the reverse of orthodox analysis. Under convention, we are blamed for living beyond our means. We want to consume in excess of our ability to produce. We are both greedy and inept. This is further reinforced by the productivity narrative, but higher productivity cannot be a solution to overproduction. And so on this, and, and likewise on this view, austerity is similarly wrongheaded overproduction cannot be resolved by further reducing incomes. So debt, as Matthew has said, remains unresolved. This IMF chart shows global public and private debt levels were much higher going into the pandemic than they were on the eve of the global financial crisis. So fundamentally, the economic crisis remained unresolved when the pandemic hit. Not for the first time, the backlash is nationalism. We see this in the Brexit process and in trade wars against China. But this follows a profoundly wrong reading of global economic conditions. The problem is not with internationalism, it is with it orienting the international system to the interests of wealth. Now, Labour is internationalist because it has understood for at least 200 years that capitalism exerts economic power by setting workers in each country against each other. 
And this has been obvious to progressives all, all along, to progressive economists all along. Matthew recognizes John Hobson, as Keynes did also, but we can in fact go back as far as the 1820s to find Jean-Charles Leonard de Sismondi rejecting rec Ricardian economics as protecting the interests of wealth and offering an early theory of gluts. Inevitably, this, th this thinking has been persuasive to, to the trade union movement. And from the 1930s, as Anne outlined, various factors came together to mean real change. After the First World War, the interests of the few had been imposed in an extreme and arrogant way. But when the system imploded, socialist and progressive forces had finally made up the necessary political ground to be able to offer a lead. And they offered what I called an internationalism on the terms of labour. Fundamentally, and perhaps paradoxically, this meant reorienting the economy to internal rather than external factors, to domestic demand rather than overseas trade. And this change, oops, this, this change was captured most neatly by the future UK Labour Party leader, Hugh Gateskill. He said, it is recognised at last that the expansion of international trade depends on the maintenance of full employment and not the other way around. The same thinking was shared by progressive forces globally. As Anne says, most importantly by President Roosevelt in the US, but also by Prime Minister Blum in France. And then the changes endured after the Second World War, albeit in compromised form. Private investment was strengthened by the consequent low interest rates that we saw earlier. Consumption was strengthened by greater labour protection at home and reduced competition overseas. On top of this was increased government spending and, and increased social protection. Domestic initiative was, of course, facilitated by changed global arrangements, by a monetary architecture to support production, not speculation, and by rules that supported labour. So very quickly to some results. The top chart is a composite G7 measure of annual average GDP growth by decade, showing the contribution of domestic demand in gray and exports in blue and imports in orange. Plainly, overall growth was higher when the economy was oriented towards domestic demand. Conversely, from the 1980s, with the domestic orientation undone, growth has been greatly weaker. Furthermore, just as Gate School predicted in the bottom chart, trade growth was also stronger under the domestic orientation. On the composite measure, export and import growth over the 1950s to 1970s was nearly double that under, since globalisation. So the domestic orientation was a greater internationalism. I want to conclude with two points. First, the post-war arrangement was profoundly compromised and far from that sort by Blum, Roosevelt and Keynes. Above all, the compromise preserved the hierarchy between North and South, between the G7 and the rest of the world. Second, I may here be justifying labour internationalism on the basis of growth, but growth isn't inherent to labour internationalism. Chasing growth, or what used to be called growthmanship, was a feature of the compromise. Labour and trade unions sought only full employment. But the fundamental conclusion is that under labour internationalism, there are no economic constraints to prevent us from shaping the world in the way that we want. The Attlee government chose to build social infrastructure. Today's priorities would obviously put climate change in front place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. And thanks again to both Anne and Matthew for, for two very dense and interesting presentations. I am afraid we're already running out of time as we are five minutes late and we have a few questions here. Um, unfortunately, I can't go through all of them. So I will just pick a couple and uh, I invite and suggest to, to the participants to also follow up with our speakers and, and write them later on. I'm sure they will be happy to, to reply to some of your questions. Um, but if I have to pick one, I think that Stephen Boxall uh, nailed it from the beginning. And the first question was actually addressed to uh, Rich, to Richard Trumka, but uh, it's, it's relevant also in our context. So he asks, um, how are we going to mainstream the key messages that we heard uh, today among the broader public? And how do we recapture international financial institutions from neoliberalism? Now, uh, in her presentation, Anne says that 
she's surprised that the American people are not revolting. Uh, but she also quotes Polanyi that a society is never aware of the international system it lives in as long as it endures. So um, she, 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 she tells us that hope comes in, in the past Keynesian experience, uh, but that, that world order followed in, in loose order a large economic depression and basically two world wars. Uh, so my question is a bit provocative and is do we do things still need to get worse before they get better and where do we start to act at the national or international level because the previous world order was single-handedly pushed by a rising democratic superpower the united states but this time around i'm not sure if that they see uh, that kind of factor on the international scene so uh, where do we start and how do we start uh, and if you want, since I addressed you, 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 you can start, but Jeff and Matthew, if you want to chip in, I would, that would be great. Thank you. I, I don't want to, I mean, this is a big question, but I want to just briefly say that I think it starts with first of all, education and awareness. And for me, that's really an important role for the trade union movement. We had such an institution, the Workers' Education Association, where workers talked about all this back in the 1930s, and we've neglected those institutions. So for me, education and awareness is terribly important, but even more important is international solidarity. We have to build that, and it's out of that that a new system will emerge ultimately. In my view, I always take the view that the people must lead in order that the leaders can follow. And that's going to have to be what we get. And that for me is what the trade union movement should be mobilizing around instead of buying into and accepting almost the current system. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Anne that I think the first step is simply to just explain, you know, how these dynamics work. I mean, that's why Michael and I, you know, wrote our book was really to, you know, even though a lot of the starting points of the argument individually are you know, incontrovertibly true by definition, putting them together in the way that we did and coming to the conclusions that we did, it is kind of counterintuitive. And it's, it's much more appealing for people to have, uh, you know, these sort of, you know, blame foreigners or alternatively say that everything is fine, rather than to think about the world as a connected system. I mean, you know, Anne talked about why are Americans not revolting? You could also say, why were Germ you know, why were Germans not revolting? And the answer is they blame, you know, Greeks and Italians and their political leaders indulged them in that, or, or in fact, you know, deliberately encouraged that. And, you know, that's really the challenge here is how do you get people to, you know, see that in fact, you know, it's not that, you know, the Chinese are taking Americans jobs, but actually that Chinese people are being harmed by the actions of the Chinese government. And as a consequence of that, many people in the rest of the world, including Americans are being harmed. So it's about, under, you know, instead of thinking about countries as the national unit of analysis, as the unit of analysis, you think about, you know, economic class and economic sectors. And that's, that's really, I think, first and foremost, intellectual challenge. Once you persuade people of that, then there's sort of political challenge. But I mean, that's, you know, that's a whole second step. And I think that's really more, you know, your department than, than my department. But I think that's really, you know, the first step is getting people just to understand how these dynamics work. Yeah. I'm going to second that, Philip. And, um, Thank you very suggest much. that we hand over to Sarah Jane for the next session. Sure. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Thank, thank you again to all of you for an interesting panel. And please, Sarah Jane, Flifton, with apologies for the delay. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. No problem at all. It sounds like a really interesting conversation, and like it could have gone on for another hour at least, um, with lots of lots of things to say. Um, so yes, hi everyone. I'm Sarah Jane Clifton. Um, I'm chairing our next session. Um, uh, I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm director of the Economic Change Unit, um, a new organisation which has been set up with the aim of strengthening the um, new economy movement here in the UK. Um, we've got some big goals for this session and not a lot of time. Um, we want to explore a number of things. Firstly, to look at how we got here, um, the post-war trajectory of policy that has led to the current deeply unjust uh, settlement for workers. Um, then to look in more detail at how the present arrangements advantage the few at the expense of the many. And then finally, crucially, to explore proposals for setting the balance right in the interests of workers. Um, a few practical reminders in case people have joined since the beginning of the session uh, before we get started. Firstly, the TUC is recording this so that the valuable content is available after the event. 
Um, there's also a TUC code of conduct, um, which uh, we'll, we will be working with this event um, and will be posted in the chat box for your information. Um, so I'm just going to move so you can see me properly because of the light. Um, and also just a flag that we do have subtitles available. Um, if you don't see them automatically, you just need to click on the caption button, which is located at the bottom of your screen um, on the same row as the Q&A box, and you should be able to switch on the subtitles. Um, and we're gonna try and squeeze in a little bit of time for Q&A, um, but because we are running really over, um, please do post your questions um, in the Q&A box. And, and can I encourage uh, the speakers for this session actually um, to keep an eye on that and to maybe try and answer some of them as we go along. Um, and then we'll pull out some of them to try and make some time um, at the end. So um, we have a really fantastic panel of speakers who kindly agreed to um, join us today. I'll introduce them one at a time before they speak. To kick off the conversation, we have Luis Vera. He is coordinator of the Bretton Woods Project, an organization based here in the UK, which works to challenge the power of the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, and to open up space for global, so global civil society organizations to influence the policies of those institutions. He previously served for eight years as chief of mission for the International Organization for Migration in Timor-Leste, as well as working in various emergency response situations in El Salvador and Kosovo. And he's also served as a guest lecturer on conflict and development at Columbia University in the States. Um, Luis, over to you. And if I can ask all the panelists actually just to shave a couple of minutes off so we can try and have a little bit of time for Q&A. If it's possible to um, keep it to eight minutes, that would be really amazing. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. It's a bit intimidating coming after the first panel, but uh, thanks for the invitation. I'll do my best to be succinct. Um, it's not an easy task to provide a, a historical scope of, you know, I'll, I'll focus on the bank and the, and the fund for obvious reasons, given my background. And apologies also if I'm repeating things that are well known by everybody. Well, I guess I would suppose I would start by saying that, you know, the bank and the fund were obviously established in a very different post-war environment in which there was a, a strong sense of the need to avoid another Great Depression. It was also uh, an effort to expand the global capitalist system with the US at its center. Um, of course, the experience of the war and massive loss of life and economic warfare also influenced the development of the UN and, and the bank and the fund. Eventually, as the Cold War deepened, the bank and the fund became a tool used by the Western powers to quote unquote, deal with the threat posed by the credible opposition uh, created by, you know, a rival system in the Soviet Union and eventually China. So that's quite interesting. Obviously, that's something that has changed since. To me here, there's an obvious link with the domestic dynamics and the creation of the welfare state uh, with key concessions made by capital in order to avoid further instability domestically. And I think this played out at the international level with the actions of the bank and the fund eventually as the Cold War deepened. This was also the case with the Marshall Plan, which worked to ensure the Western Europe did not gravitate elsewhere after the war. I think the, if you look at the reflection of US power within the system at its inception, you can look at the defeat of the Keynes Bancor at the establishment of the IMF as a good example of the US power to determine outcomes at that early stage and to a certain extent, to a large extent, it continues to this day. The current reliance on, glo on, the, on the dollar is the world's principal reserve currency remains a linchpin of US global economic influence as we have seen throughout the pandemic. You know, going fast forwarding through history a bit, <laughs> the big shift in World Bank and IMF positions, roles and approaches really was propelled by the big push for financial liberalization in the 1980s and the related rise in globalization as we understand it. Of course, globalization didn't begin in 1980s, precedes that, but that was a key event in its um, development and the fall of communism as represented by the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, 89. The debt crisis of the 80s and 90s was used by the bank and the fund and the fund had then become you know the the key instrument used to uh, deal with debt issues and became a very powerful instrument at that to push for significant changes in domestic economic and political arrangements which of course we know contrary to the bank and funds rhetoric that these are closely interlinked right through the now infamous structural adjustment programs. The SAPs, as they're known, um, were very much in contradiction with the request of the developing world for knowledge and technology transferred as, 
was evident and explicitly outlined in the UNGA resolution of 1974 calling for a new international economic order. The, the structural adjustment programs open local economies to a greater extent, not only to well-known uh, transnational corporations involved in manufacturing, but also crucially to international finance. The bank and the fund since the mid eighties have been following a series of evolving development um, economic consensuses. The Washington consensus, the post-Washington consensus and what uh, Daniela Gabor from Bristol calls the Wall Street consensus. I think we, most of us would know that the Washington consensus was which underpinned the structural adjustment programs, particularly in Latin America, was positive that you know, markets are the best suited to allocate resources and that the state intervention was inefficient at best and counterproductive at worst. It supported privatization of state-owned enterprises, opening of markets to more, effic more efficient foreign firms and investments and deregulation, including of labor, of course, as we know. While the post-Washington consensus associated with former World Bank economist Stiglitz is normally seen as a progressive um, way forward for the bank and the fund as it acknowledges the existence of market failures and thus reinserts the state into the development debate. There are others who consider merely as a refashioning of the state uh, as a mechanism to internalize the externalities of, of the market failures. It sets the stage for what we see now as a de-risking stage, uh, de-risking de -risking state, my apologies. And now the Washington consensus reflects the rise of finance that you know, uh, has been spoken about at length by the, in the previous panel in the development sphere. And this can be clearly seen in the World Bank's billions to trillions agenda, which really notes that the only way to ensure the achievement of the sustainable development goals is to, uh, through the cooperation with international, mostly international finance, through blended finance, where you subsidize um, private finance through uh, the use of public finance tools. I think it's important to make clear something that seems quite obvious, but I think it's important. The bank and the fund are comprised of people who are by and large believe in this, the systems and policies they advocate. I, I suppose one can make a similar argument about other actors as well. And this brings up the interesting question that was touched upon by the previous panel and a very complex question about how economic and other orthodoxies are created and propagated. The question of narrative is for me essential in, in these discussions. So what are the implications, well, of these trajectories? At the structural level, as argued by Hagdu Cheng and others, the bank and fund have contributed to international economic relations that have deprived the global south of the policy tools used by the global north to industrialize and quote unquote develop. Wallerstein would call this uh, core periphery relations, where the core extracts wealth and income from the periphery. Patrick Bond and Ana Garcia argue that similar relationships exist within the periphery, for example, by actions, these can be seen in the actions of South Africa, Brazil, and China, although whether we still think China is a periphery nation or not, it's an open question. Um, the, the World Bank and IMF have been pivotal in the expansion of globalization, particularly after the 1980s. Uh, and in doing so, I, I think this is crucially links into what was discussed in the, in the previous panel the, since the 1980s, the bank and the fund contributed to the erosion of state of the state with a dramatic impact on its ability to provide essential services. As Costa Las Pavitzas and others have argued, this has pushed people into the greater levels of self-reliance and dependence on private and financial actors. This has led to the development of profitable income streams for the private sectors, for example, PPPs. And this relates to the point that was made um, in the previous panel around the uh, the divergence between, I don't like to use these terms, but for shorthand, between uh, the real and the financial economy, right? So finance is looking for income streams that are um, not born out of consumption, but born out of uh, consumption of essential goods, for example, health systems, etc. Of particular relevance to labor, the bank and the funds has contributed to the, have contributed to the erosion of labor protection and contributed to attacks on labor unions. While not the only reason, this has led to a well-documented share of income going to labor, um, a decrease in income share going to labor, I'm sorry, and thus further the driving workers into a financialized and precarious existences. 
and uh, the World Bank's doing business report is a flagship of example of this type of approach. I'm trying to keep uh, uh, two minutes. Very good, I'm more or less okay. Um, at the individual level, this uh, plays out by an increased reliance on finance to meet essential needs, as this was also discussed in the previous panel. This exposes the individual to additional extraction of income. Unfortunately, the trend towards financial deepening, i.e. the expansion of for-profit financial services to the underserved, underserved communities is quite pronounced today. As mentioned, the idea that the private sector can act as a reliable development partner is deeply embedded in the development discourse, in fact, there are some very prominent examples of how the World Bank and fund contribute, particularly as financialization has deepened to, su to support the transfer of resources to finance in particular, to systems that benefit the few and, and not the many. I'll just note, uh, I, so I'm not gonna get to the, I won't share with you my uh, pity um, ideas about how to resolve the, uh, the inconsistencies in the world uh, financial architecture, but maybe we can talk about that. But I just note, you know, to echo something that was said before, you look at the imbalance between finance and the others. You know, BlackRock has over $8 trillion under management. And you can see how this affects its relationships with, the, um, with states. Um, and you can see this very well. In fact, the power of finance is very um, visible in the dynamics around the G20's debt suspension initiative, which if you have been following the discussion, you have seen that the private sector has refused to participate, not in debt cancellation, but in suspension of payments. So what that has resulted in is the fact that the, the suspension made available by bilateral official donors, some of those resources, instead of may, being made available to pay for essential pandemic responses have been used to pay private creditors. You can also, another good example of the consequence of these approaches is what's been happening with the vaccines um, you have seen that we have an underproduction of vaccines and, you know, uh, much of the developing world has not instituted vaccination programs. Meanwhile, the corporate, the pharmaceutical companies are fighting tooth and nail for um, efforts by states to make use of an intellectual property waiver at the World Trade Organization. So just to say that these dynamics have very, very concrete and tangible impacts on the lives of billions of people today. So I realize I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Luis. Um, next, we have Rosa Crawford. Rosa is um, a policy officer at the TUC, leading on international trade and migration. She re represents the TUC on a range of governmental and international expert trade advisory groups, um, including the EU Domestic Advisory Group for CETA um, and also the EU Japan Agreement. Um, and previously, worked, she worked as a local organizer in Birmingham um, on TUC's youth employment campaigns in the Black Country. Rosa, over to you. Oh, yeah, could keep it to eight minutes as well. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so for my intervention, I'd like to outline what a global workers agenda on trade would look like to address failings in the current system and how the TUC is working with our sister trade unions internationally to push for this agenda. And it's really great to be on this panel with two of our sister organizations we work with on trade from Nigeria and East Africa. So really looking forward to our dialogue here. So I wanted to emphasize from the outset the point that Rich Schrompke and also Jeff and others have made that our campaigns to regulate trade and indeed uh, all global rules must be internationalist and the workers movement has always had to be internationalist in its campaigns on trade in order to counter the global power of capital. We need to demand common standards globally and common protections to protect to prevent a race to the bottom. And this is in stark contrast to the UK Conservative government's Global Britain agenda, which is really a jingoistic vision of Britain reheating an imperialist trade policy. The trade union vision, by complete contrast, is using trade as a lever to support good jobs, drive up standards, promote gender equality, and reduce inequalities between the global north and the global south. So I just wanted to highlight what the key components of that workers' trade agenda are, and then some of our activities to campaign for it. So first of all, it's crucial for us that trade agreements and World Trade Organization rules enforce protections on workers' rights rather than undermine them, as is too often the case at the moment. 
We know currently trade deals and WTO rules allow social protections to be removed as they can be interpreted as barriers to trade. And we know there's no requirement for WTO members to respect ILO standards and the majority of trade agreements contain no effective mechanisms to ensure their signatories respect workers' rights. And while some trade agreements have that requirement on paper around commitments to ILO standards, the lack of an enforcement mechanism has meant they aren't realised. So in the case of Colombia, it signed a trade agreement with both the UK and the EU that involves commitments to ILO standards, but because there's been no enforcement mechanism, there's been no consequence when over the last year, over 300 social leaders and human rights defenders, including trade unionists, have been murdered. And that's one of the reasons why the TUC is calling for the UK's trade deal uh, with Colombia to be sustained suspended because those uh, commitments haven't been enforced. So what we would want to see is a requirement for all WTO members to uphold core international labour organisation standards and the WTO and trade deals to contain effective mechanisms to enforce them. And to be effective, they need to involve trade unions. At the moment, trade unions have been shut out of the process of enforcing labour standards, and that's meant that action hasn't been taken, as in the case of Colombia or South Korea or many other countries, uh, when that when labour standards have been abused, trade unions need to be brought into the process. The second key component is around tariff policy and ensuring it stimulates and supports decent jobs. We can't just have tariff reduction at all costs in every circumstance, as has too often been the goal of certainly UK government as well as other governments approach towards trade agreements and WTO rules. Tariffs should, of course, be lowered on sectors that depend on imports, like the manufacturing sector in the UK depends on having that tariff-free trade with the EU, and that's, that's what we've supported. But some sectors, such as the steel sector in the UK or agriculture sector in many of the African countries, and I'm sure Caroline will talk about this in the context of East Africa, they need to retain tariffs to continue to be protected from unfair trade practice, like dumping of steel in the UK or dumping of indeed UK and EU agriculture goods uh, in East Africa. So that's why it's very important that tariff policy is designed with in dialogue with trade unions so that we can have the protections that are needed and decent job creation is at its heart. And thirdly, trade rules need to ensure protections for public services and promote public health. Currently, WTO rules and trade agreements inadequately exempt public services, which has allowed them to be locked in to uh, privatisation and has meant governments can be challenged when they try and renationalise or regulate public services. And then we know too many trade agreements contain this special ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, corporate court system that allows multinational companies to sue governments when they try to uh, renationalize or regulate public services in a way that damages profits, as, as this is the case with Slovakia that was sued by a Dutch insurance company in 2007 for renationalizing part of its public services. As trade unions, we are saying there should be no corporate court, no ISDS system in any trade agreements and public services need to be completely exempted. And from a public health perspective, as Louise touched on, it's really important that we have a waiver for those WTO intellectual property rules that are currently preventing Global South countries from producing affordable versions of the COVID vaccine that their population so desperately need. And you'll see a key part of the Labour 7, the L7 statement is calling for a waiver to those TRIPS rules to allow countries to produce uh, those versions of the vaccines. So now I want to turn to <clears throat> what trade unions in the UK are doing with our international partners to achieve this, this workers' vision, those key components of what we see uh, for, from a, a global trade agenda. And to say that TUC works internationally through our umbrella organization, the International TUC, as well as bilaterally with a number of, of sister trade union centers. So a major part of our campaigning involves pushing for trade unions to be involved in trade negotiations and the development of WTO rules. They, we know these rules don't benefit working people and don't benefit society because we haven't been in the room when they've been negotiated. And so getting that access is absolutely critical. And that's where our partnership with trade unions in other countries is so important because we know trade unions in many other countries have much closer access and indeed more influence and are able to influence government's agenda more than we have yet been able to in the UK, where we've been shut out of all the negotiations the UK government has currently uh, engaged 
engaged in with other countries. We were not consulted on the text of any of the trade agreements the UK has signed to date. But we know in other countries, we can have more influence when we work collectively uh, and combine the influences we have. So just to give two quick examples from East Africa uh, and the US. So with East Africa, the TUC is working with Caroline's organization, the East Africa TUC, on a project to expand trade union capacity and trade negotiations. And as a result of that project, we built up lobbying and trade unions, particularly in Kenya, built up lobbying on uh, the UK-Kenya trade agreement. And as a result of that lobbying and the fact that there was a dialogue established between the government of Kenya and the trade unions there, the Kenyan government has agreed to review the UK-Kenya trade agreement in a year's time, which opens up the possibility for revisions to that agreement to address concerns we have around uh, undermining decent jobs and labour standards and public services, and also potentially for that, for that agreement to not to be applied anymore. Turning to the US, we really as TUC value the very close working relationship we have with the um, AFL-CIO, the union centre in the US, and we've established a number of joint positions with them. And the, we know from this um, with collaboration that trade unions in the US have a much closer engagement in trade negotiations than uh, trade unions in the UK and have been able to use that uh, to positively influence trade agreements. So we have the US-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement, uh, which had a much stronger uh, labor chapter and provisions uh, to enforce labor standards as a result of that um, dialogue that, that trade unions are able to have with government, that consultation uh, with trade unions that took place uh, in the US during those negotiations. And now, of course, it's great to see the influence that unions have uh, on the new administration in the US, which has declared that it will have a worker-centered approach to trade, which I'm sure Heather Bushi in the next panel is going to talk more about. Uh, but it's key features of which have been very much supportive of the agenda I outlined at the start around having stronger enforcement of uh, labor rights, um, being able to target companies for abuses of those rights, and making sure there are no corporate courts and trade deals, and uh, supporting the, the Paris agenda. Now, I'm coming towards the end of my time, so just to highlight that the coalition working that we've also been establishing as trade unions has been really important, including, in fact, with a number of international employers organizations like the International Chamber of Commerce. We've established a joint statement with them about how we need to have transparency and global trade rules that support uh, a race to the top. So some business organizations see the benefit of a level playing field uh, or based on uh, high standards. And of course, the L7 itself, this event uh, and the dialogue we established here, and then the meetings in the run up uh, to the G7 also provide a really important international platform to push for that changed agenda and those different global rules. So I think in summation, just to say that change has been possible. We have had stronger workers' rights enforcement in some trade agreements like the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, also the UK-EU agreement, which for the first time UK and EU have signed up to penalties and sanctions when labor standards are abused. It shows what we can achieve when we work together through global solidarity. Uh, so I hope this event will encourage more of you to get involved in that campaign. And I, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosa. Um, lots of really important stuff in there about how to make trade rules really support decent jobs and the protection of labour rights and also wider economic and social rights. Um, and also really exciting to hear about that international work to build trade uh, lobbying capacity in the labour movement. Um, next, it's really fantastic to be able to welcome Caroline Kamati Magala. Um, is Caroline with us? Yes. Um, great. Uh, Caroline is uh, General Secretary of the East Africa Trade Union Confederation, um, which represents more than three million workers. She's also the first and so far the only woman currently heading up a sub-regional trade union in Africa, um, taking up that position after only 10 years in the movement, which is an incredibly impressive trajectory. Um, Caroline is a, a former member of the Commonwealth Civil Society Advisory Committee representing Eastern Africa, um, and also a member of the Trade Union Development Cooperation Network. Um, and in our session today, she's going to take an Africa regional wide perspective um, on the issues that we're looking at. Caroline, over to you. And I think um, it's seven minutes, if that's okay. Oh, th thank you, thank you very much. Um, I don't know where to start from because uh, Africa is so so huge uh, and uh, very fragmented in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, what approach I'll take, but I'll, I'll try to, 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 to eat the elephant in the room as, as much as I can. I think the, the, uh, the foundation has already been laid by the previous speakers, and uh, I was very excited just following uh, Louis' uh, presentation because I, I felt like he had you know, laid the basis in terms of what kind of policies have affected trade in, um, in Africa. So I'm not going to, into you know, uh, mentioning those details, but I would look at what these policies have done for Africa and what we can do moving forward. I think one of the most important um, statistics I like bringing up when you're talking about trade and development in Africa and particularly how it has affected employment is the issue around informal economy. Um, uh, by 2018, the ILO employs 85.5% of uh, the labor force in Africa. Where I come from, East Africa, 90% uh, of the economy is actually in the informal sector. And the informal sector contributes over 60% um, contributes around 60% to the GDP of the East African country. So I think it's really important when we talk about trade and we talk about employment and labor in Africa, it's, it's, it's very important for us to, to have the informal economy at the back of our mind as we talk about policies and, and, and building better. And, and, and also for the first time, Africa is, 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 is facing a recession in 25 years. There has been a decline in, in, in growth, you know, starting from 2020 with the, with the pandemic, and we are experiencing massive job losses. The ILO is um, estimating it to be around 4.9%, uh, which is an equivalent of around 19 million uh, workers. So the projected effect uh, of this pandemic are really you know, devastating already for the labor market and economies of Africa that has been undermined by over 40 years of neoliberal policies that Louise has talked about, the structural adjustment programs, privatization um, of basic services, health, water, you know, education, uh, growth of precarious you know, uh, work, but also looking at the loss of the developmental state of our government in terms of pro providing um, uh, basic services to, to its citizens. But what have these policies actually done for Africa? They have led to an integration of trade, technology, and labor that has produced and reproduced and sustained unfair global production architecture, manifesting unimaginable social costs. Most of um, you know, we, we, we are always told that in Africa, agriculture, agriculture is the backbone of the economies of Africa. But uh, when you look at that backbone, we are purely raw material exporters. You look at the neoliberal global financial economy architecture in Africa, which has reproduced economies, um, economic insecurity, which has been a prime source of social injustice. Look at what is happening in the DRC Congo, a very rich uh, country in resources, but manned by, uh, you know, insecurity and, and wars. Look at Somali, Sudan, the South Sudan. The continent, you know, continues to, you know, experience historical imba imbalances, and some of them Louis had already mentioned. And I'm particularly looking at the production system that is driven by capital interest and continue to produce and, and also reproduce you know, social uh, human casualties, increased informality, precarious job, joblessness, economic growth that we experience you know, across the continent. And also just looking at how um, under neoliberal you know, globalization, global commodities and value chains of the formal and informal economies are now linked across the borders of many countries influencing employment, but producing decent work deficit and particularly for, for the region. And looking at this global value chain, Africa is actually at the bottom of this global 
um, uh, particularly value chains. You know, just, you know, picking a few examples across the continent, you know, foreign trade has been a form of exploitation in Africa, you know, truth be told. Look at cocoa in the West Africa, producing a third of the world's cocoa, but mad with child labor, peasant farming, yet, you know, big multinationals like Mars, Nestle, making billions in profits. I'm really looking forward to the decision that the president of um, Ghana made in terms of not exporting cocoa and adding more value to their cocoa so as to in increase uh, productivity in, 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 the, in the cocoa and, and probably getting more. Uh, coffee in Ethiopia is the same story. Kenya, Tanzania, they, they are selling a kilo for $4 while coffee co corporation are selling, you know, a kilo for $200, making a kill, you know, uh, companies like, like Starbucks. Uh, mining is, is, is a tragic story across the continent. You know, take for example, Britain. Uh, British companies are mining corporations over uh, 37 sub-Saharan countries. They collectively control over 1 trillion worth of Africans most uh, valuable resources. And if I just take an example of the British gold companies, Acacia and Rand Gold Resources, they control, you know, about, you know, 12.5 million ounces of gold um, uh, in Africa. Uh, and and I, uh, going back to, you know, the, the DRC tragic uh, experience, we, we know that uh, children are forced to work in the dangerous mine with little or no pay. Some of them die from the tunnel collapses or suffer from injuries. Many big techs, you know, Google, Apple, Dell, Glencore, Microsoft, you know, should be held ac accountable. And there is evidence to suggest that these companies are actually aware that the cobalt they use in their products is a source uh, is, is sourced by child labor, but clearly they aren't doing you know much to stop it. And, and, and I think I can't finish without talking about how much Africa is losing. Africa is losing billions of dollars because of multinational companies that are actually cheating African governments out of their vital revenues by not paying their share of taxes. And then and, and an UNCTAD report on economic development in Africa in 2020 actually ex estimates that Africa loses 88.6 billion annually from illicit financial flows from the continent. You know, for me, this is, this is not just a statistic, but these are missed opportunities, lost livelihood and increased poverty. You know, what would, what, and to just bring this uh, closer home, the estimated, rec uh, the estimated record between uh, 1970 to 2008 on illicit financial flows were actually over 800 billion from Africa. And another UNCTAD report actually estimates the, the, the funding gap to reach the SDGs by 2030 for Africa is 2200 billion per year. So moving forward, I think for us, supporting a human-centered recovery in, 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 in Africa is key, putting people at the center of, of development. The issue around uh, debt relief and increased public uh, development assistance for developing countries is also key, but also looking at resource mobilization efforts through progressive taxation and national level are complemented by strengthening of international cooperation in ending tax evasion and illicit uh, financial flows. But I would just like to conclude by saying for Africa in particular, it is, it is actually important for us to have a comprehensive paradigm shift that recognizes the development, the developmental states of our government. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Caroline. So lots of emphasis there on policies which first and foremost stop the extraction of wealth from um, uh, developing economies like 
um, the African countries um, uh, and then supporting a, a change in the development paradigm away from this kind of extractivist destructive model um, which keeps countries locked into low value um, raw material processing and low value agriculture. Um, I, I just remind our audience members we do have the Q&A box open so um, if you have questions as the speakers are, are talking please drop them in there and we can pick them up at the end. Um, so finally, I'm really pleased to welcome Tolu Fagbenige. Tolu is a very talented and up and coming member of the African Trade Union Movement. She's currently chairperson of the Nigeria Labour Congress Youth Committee. Um, and she's going to speak for five minutes um, on the specific experience of the Nigerian Labour Movement in relation to our subject today. Tolu, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tolu from Nigeria. Um, first of all, I am going to state the obvious and say this is more or less a case of neoliberalism, of capitalism. The post-war policy has privileged the few and the capital power has been given to that few, including cost of production. They believe capital can buy land, labor and entrepreneurship because these capitalists have resources, they actually dictate the pace. Even work relation is affected, for example, people doing the same work and getting different wages. It has brought about, you know, acronyms like um, casual in the world of work, which is used interchangeably, which has even more weakened our regular status. Furthermore, the contract workers are doing the same work that the regular workers are doing, but with less wages and, you know, less opportunities. Also, in the era of um, globalization, global institutions such as the UN, the International Monetary Fund, um, the World Bank, etc., play a huge role in formulating and influencing policies which largely shape the socioeconomic conditions in the national and state levels, also globally. The neoliberal macroeconomic structure is very critical to globalization as much as oxygen is critical to humans. It is of course an established fact that neoliberal policies of deregularization, deregulation, privatization, reduced public funding, etc., impact the poor and working people adversely. It has led to um, the industrialization in some places rising unemployment and so on. Nigeria's case is a good instance, but it must be noted that um, the adoption and implementation of the Washington consensus was not without the influence of the IMF and the World Bank. Now, in the years following the 1970s global economic crisis, full implementation of neoliberal structural adjustment program is the conditionality attached to foreign loan from the IMF and the World Bank, especially to the Global South countries. Now, the World Trade Organization, through its DJ in recent time, continues to push for more trade liberalization with the Nigerian government. Trade liberalization simply means market deregulation that includes labor markets. That implies that workers can be engaged, if engaged at all, under any conditions, which is often than not precarious. Aside the labor market deregulation that reduce workers to commodity, trade liberalization model encourages state actors to you know, provide more incentives to the corporations. We understand that means subsidizing private ventures with public funds providing tax reliefs and incentive to corporations and promoting low wages and drastic reduction in funding of social services to mention but a few. That obviously places the profits of the transnational and big corporations over the fundamental needs of the workers and the global institution with their policies play a central role in that. That's about what I have to say for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tolu. Um, concise, but really important and um, uh, points to end on there. 
Um, I think there's some very clear headlines that have come out of the presentations, um, even though our panelists haven't had very long. Um, and for me, the headlines are that the global institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO and the trade agreements um, uh, that the WTO um, has been enforcing are bastions of the neoliberal economic model um, that they have since um, the Second World War been working to advance the interests of multinational corporations and global elites. Uh, and their policies have played a central role in perpetuating and reinforcing both the exploitation and the impoverishment of workers, as well as inequality at the global level um, with the continued um, impoverishment of developing countries and also inequalities within countries. Um, we've got a couple of questions. We've got uh, about eight minutes um, and a couple of questions in the box. Um, I'm going to pose those questions to the panelists. Um, and I'm also going to ask the panelists um, We'll have one round of um, responses to the questions. I'm going to ask you and um, invite you to answer um, uh, one, which question it feels most important to you um, and you have the most to say on. Um, and also, if you're willing to give me your top priority policy change that we need to enact at the global level um, in order to address these issues that we've been looking at in this session and to set the balance right in the interests of workers. Um, uh, and yes, you're, you're going to have about two minutes each uh, to do that. So yeah, whichever of these questions you want to answer and then your top priority policy change. Um, so really important question that we've um, someone's uh, raised in the box, first of all, um, about the, the transition to a green economy and renewable energy resources. So obviously, these are re really important transitions that we need to make in the global economy um, in order to uh, um, uh, stop runaway climate change from getting worse and avoid climate catastrophe. But there's very big concerns about whether they will lead to higher levels of structural unemployment um, and in turn perpetuate uh, more economic inequalities, um, as well as concerns about other negative impacts for workers. So there's that question. Um, and then um, we've got a, a question directed to our speakers um, from Africa. So Caroline Tolo, do you see um, the, I don't quite know this acronym, but hopefully you do, the AFCFTA, um, which I think is an African regional trade agreement possibly, as a step in the right direction for workers' rights on the continent, or is it a reproduction of problematic uh, free trade liberalization initiatives? Um, so we're going to, uh, follow the, the order that we had at the beginning, um, starting with Luis and ending with Tolu. Um, and yeah, two minutes, please, um, with your uh, responses and final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I'll focus on the question around the green recovery or the transition. I think, well, this is a question that really concerns us very deeply because, you know, for us, I think the key issue is to look at the green transition from a social um, perspective as well as environmental perspective, right? What we want to avoid is a green transition that perpetuates the same type of uh, consumption and power relationships, but is powered, you know, increasingly by renewable source of energy. So I think the idea there would be to trans to think of the Green New Deal and the transformation as a structural transformation of power relations and of consumption patterns, et cetera. Obviously, easier said than done, but I think you know that's how we need to think about it. Um, as far as my focus on, I think there's some. To me, the the key thing to do now is to try to address the imbalances that were mentioned in the first uh, panel around increasing wages, economic activity, and um, disciplining finance. You can do that through, for example, you know, tr a foreign uh, transaction tax, more support for capital controls, both ways in and out. So I think some, some of those uh, policy changes would be worth exploring. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Rosa? Thanks very much for the questions. I mean, I think maybe to pick up also on the, the um, green transformation question, I mean, the trade union movement has pushed for many, many years now a just transition, which means a transition that is in dialogue uh, with working people. So it's governments in dialogue with trade unions and employers to make sure that we are creating new green jobs, not just displacing workers from old 
jobs in carbon intensive industries. So that's something that in the run up to the COP meeting uh, in November in Glasgow, we are doing a lot of intensive campaigning about and the international TUC has a lot of um, uh, resources on this if you want to look on your website. But yes, it's very important that it is a process of dialogue that develops this new green agenda. And also that we use the trade rules and WTO rules to actually enforce these high standards. So again, there are penalties built into trade agreements for breaking breaches of the Paris Agreement and exports um, of, of carbon intensive in, um, goods so that you're actually using trade as a means to lock in those high standards and disincentivize and penalize uh, carbon intensive industries. And again, developing those kind of rules in dialogue with trade unions. And that links with the, the fundamental policy change I think that needs to be seen, which is the inclusion of working people in the development of these global trade rules and to address these power in balances, as again, building on, on what Louisa said about the development of these rules. I mean, we know within IMF, World Bank and the WTO, Global South countries have never had the same voice or influence or voting power. So they need to be brought into the discussions, but trade unions need to be brought into those discussions as well to make sure that the outcomes of these negotiations actually benefit working people and the social goods and the social protections uh, we all need. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rosa. Caroline. Um, I think I, I would take the answer, I'll take the question on, on the African continental free trade agreement. If you would ask me, it's, it's both an opportunity and it will also bring, comes, come, it also comes along with its challenges. An opportunity, you know, for Africa to be compared, you know, to, to have, you know, a, um, a seat on the, on the global trade as one. So we are going, uh, we are trading as a block and, and coming in with the numbers, you know, as, as, as uh, 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 when we because when we trade as only one country, then we are a little bit weak. So there are opportunities that are there that will trickle down to employment and also an opportunity for us to, to, to grow our competitiveness in terms of uh, the productivity within the value chains and also growing our SMEs because we, we will not be able to deal with the issue of informality if we cannot be able to grow our SMEs to uh, to, 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 to bigger companies in terms of providing uh, decent jobs and, 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 and all that. But also it brings in the questions that the trade union has always been asking. When you are creating this free trade area and looking at you know, the big role that the private sector has been given in terms of uh, uh, how they are going to benefit from this free trade uh, agreement, and then you ask yourself for Africa, who are this private sector? Because we clearly know who are the you know, big multi corporations. So we are just creating it, you know, a single market for them to, you know, easily, you know, uh, in terms of looking at the, the, the illicit financial trade, uh, uh, illicit financial flows that are already uh, being siphoned out of Africa, you know, creating a bigger level playing field for them. So who are these private sector that will be benefiting? And we are taking examples from uh, AGOA agreement. You, you look at the companies that are actually exporting under the AGOA agreement, majority of those countries are not owned by Africans. So someone else is already benefiting at this kind of um, a preferential uh, a trade agreements that are there. You look at the economic partnership agreements with EU, look at the UK, US, uh, Kenya agreement. Those are the questions that we are asking. Where is the common person within all this architecture that you are putting up there in place? So it's both, uh, you will look at it with both sides of uh, or look at it from both sides of the coin. It's an opportunity, but it also comes with challenges that we as trade unions need to, uh, to, to, to flag out. Thank you, Caroline. And I was going to invite Tolu as well to um, answer the question and also uh, give her final 
policy proposal, but I think maybe she um, she looks like she's rushed, rushed off to go and do some labour organising, which is uh, possibly more urgent, um, uh, which is good because we're actually out of time. Um, but I think there's some really important um, proposals and solutions which have come through um, fundamentally around strengthening the voice and influence both of developing countries, but also workers and trade unions across the board in the policy development and decision making um, at, at the multilateral level. And that starting point for that is actually the, the voice of workers at the national level and making sure that governments are acting in the interests of workers in those negotiations. And then um, other really important proposals around ensuring just transition for workers in, in terms of the transition to a green economy, making sure that trade rules really lock in high labour standards um, and also including working people in the development of the detail of those trade rules. Um, I, I for one that found that really useful. Um, I hope our audience found that really useful. I'd like to thank the panel members for such informative contributions um, and for the insightful questions that we got. Um, and I think we're moving very swiftly into the final session um, where, where we've got a really fantastic high, high profile set of speakers, um, but also a real emphasis on solutions and what do we do about all of this. So uh, please stay with us um, and thank Thanks again to the panel. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think uh, I'm taking the baton now. My name's Gail Cartmail. I'm the president of the TUC this year, and I'm also Assistant General Secretary of the Trade Union Unite. We have a stellar panel. Um, they're all very welcome indeed. And as I'm speaking, I think they're joining us on screen. Um, there's a slight reordering uh, of uh, speakers, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, you've heard over a couple of sessions how economics and global institutions have failed working people across the world. And probably nothing demonstrates that more than austerity. The wrong answer, to the 2008-09 crisis of financial globalization, and one that we can all see made things um, a lot worse, uh, certainly not better. And the UK government can talk about building back better after the pandemic, but there's nothing at all on the global agenda um, to address chronic global inequalities, let alone ensure decent work for all. Now, in contrast, our speakers have argued that financial globalization and a race to the bottom on pay and conditions is not the natural order of things. There is a different and better way forward, as um, Sarah said, uh, solutions. So we're, I'm delighted and we're all delighted to um, close today by hearing their views on the way forward. Um, I've already mentioned the highly distinguished panel. I have got pages and pages of detailed biographies um, and I'm not going to read them out. So you can look at them up on Wikipedia. They are very eminent. Um, many have published books and they're all very famous. Um, but what I'd like to do is to uh, spare you that so that we have a bit of time uh, for discussion. Um, we're going to take uh, um, Jayate Ghosh uh, first, um, she is Professor of Economics at uh, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, in the USA. I have no idea what time it is where you are. Um, I hope uh, it's not too early or too late. Um, Jerti, uh, you've got about five minutes and you're very welcome indeed. Uh, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and I apologize for jumping the queue. It's because I mix, mixed up the time zones as well myself. You know, I want to focus on only one thing and I've been listening to some of the discussions before this which have been extremely interesting and important. But I think what I really want to emphasize is that before we build back better, we have to stop the destruction. And this destruction is ongoing now. I know that many people will talk about the implications of finance and austerity, which you've already mentioned. Right now, I want to focus on vaccines because it really does bother me that the progressive movement in the advanced countries is not taking this up as a priority. And to me, honestly, I think silence is complicity. I think we really need to maximize the discussion and create a lot of public mobilization against the not just the travesty, but what is going on in the name of vaccines. 
87% uh, of the vaccines that were administered globally until yesterday went to less than 14% of the population, all of whom, most of whom happen to rich, uh, live in rich or upper middle income countries. This is unacceptable, but what it also means is that we are going to get more and more variants, mutations of the, vac uh, of the disease, which will come back and get people in the rich countries as well. Already in my own country of India, we are getting mutations which are varieties of the Brazilian and South African put together and which are apparently impervious to the vaccine. Now, this kind of thing is actually completely unnecessary. There is a facility, a global facility, COVAX, which is supposed to distribute to all countries equally. It's completely underfunded, including by the UK and the US. It needs at least 25 billion. At the moment, it's got little more than 4 billion. Whereas these are countries that are going in for very, very large fiscal expansions themselves. But COVAX is only one part of the problem. The bigger problem is that we are simply not producing enough vaccines. And that's really because intellectual property rights are enabling multinational pharma companies to control the production of the approved vaccines. This is despite the fact that these pharma companies have benefited massively from public subsidies. The US has given 12 billion to just six companies. The EU has given at least 10 billion to various different companies and so on and so forth. But they have also benefited from public research. We know that the AstraZeneca vaccine was basically done with public research in Oxford University, publicly funded uh, research. Now, at the moment, there is a proposal in the WTO for the waiving of all intellectual property rights uh, for COVID-19 vaccines and related treatment. There's a huge shortage of remdesivir. I have friends in Delhi at this moment who cannot get access to this life-saving drug and may possibly even suffer fatality because of this even though India is one of the larger producers of remdesivir. Why? Because of these patent laws. We have enough production capacity in the world. It is simply that pharma companies are able to exercise their control and grant licenses only where they want and in ways that keep their monopoly power and enable countries to actually, uh, and, I mean, uh, enable these companies to prevent the production. The WTO proposal is being blocked by the rich countries very recently, the Biden administration has suggested that it may be open to rethinking this. I really, I would plea uh, with everybody, with Heather and with everybody else that please, please, please make this happen because it is urgent for people across the world, not just in developing countries. It's urgent for people in the North as well. It, the current thing only benefits pharma companies. It does not benefit people or countries anywhere else in the world. So essentially what I'm saying is, please raise your voices. Please create more outcry on this. This is something the trade union movement, the labor movement in the North must do. It's not good enough to have developing countries demand this. The people of the North have to demand an end to the intellectual property right control during a pandemic. They were never designed for pandemics. And to ensure that we actually can defeat this disease, we cannot build back if we destroy whatever there is already. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a very, very powerful opening to our session. And um, I love the fact that you've opened with a call for action. Let's uh, carry on as uh, in that vein. That's uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. That's a takeaway we can all act on. So our second speaker I'm delighted to introduce is Heather Bushi, who is uh, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors member to the relatively newly elected President Biden. Hurrah, you're very welcome, Heather. Um, and we look forward to hearing uh, from you. I understand you've got a bit more time. Um, so uh, please, please, uh, please be our guest. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Trades Union Congress for inviting me to participate in this conference. I'm building back a better world. Um, and thank you, Gail, for setting the stage. Um, and you know, for those, uh, this is, it's so great to be here today, thank you. So um, I'm here today because as we all know, we're experiencing the greatest global crisis in recent times. While each country has had its own individual experiences, we've all shared the devastation that the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuing economic crisis has wrought. And I'm guessing as members of trades unions that this all resonates with you and your experiences in your own countries. 
Um, I want to take my time this morning, um, well, it's morning here where I am in the United States. Um, I want to take some time to talk about the experience here in the United States in addressing these dual crises and how we plan to rebound and meet President Biden's vision of not just building back, but building back better. So this past year has laid bare the structural inequities in the US economy and stretched the capacity of our healthcare systems. But I share President Biden's optimism that we can create a stronger, more resilient economy and a more equitable world on the other end. Of course, the challenges facing the US economy uh, and the world are quite daunting. The global pandemic, weather-related disasters due to climate change, economic inequality, which has been exacerbated by the unequal recovery after the Great Recession. Here in the United States, we've seen millions of families struggling to pay rent, put food on the table, and figure out how to care for their families. So the Biden administration is approaching these challenges with an agenda aimed at the scale and scope of the problems. The $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan has focused on getting vaccine shots in arms distributing financial support to families and businesses, and supporting state and local governments across our country. It delivers relief through direct payments, extensions to unemployment benefits, greater subsidies to health insurance, and by providing resources for families to cover the cost of both care and emergency paid leave. Even before this current crisis, too many families in the United States struggled to get by, even as our economy grew. Over the past half century, income and wealth inequality have grown to new heights, on par with the Gilded Age nearly a century ago. And one thing that 2020 unmasked was that it would reveal to us all how foundational the care economy is. Childcare centers and schools closed and parents just couldn't get to work. Millions, disproportionately women, have left the workforce to care for their families. The American Rescue Plan paved the way for change. It included the most significant investment in childcare since World War II. As we rebuild, continuing to center care this quarter our economic success will remain vital. Now looking forward, President Biden's American Jobs Plan is designed to deepen and broaden America's middle class and enhance and support uh, the competitiveness of businesses. The American Jobs Plan repairs roads and bridges and tunnels and public transport that take us to work. It eliminates 100% of lead pipes and service lines to deliver clean water to all families. It expands access to reliable, high-speed broadband internet so that everyone, including those who live in rural areas and underserved communities, can access the resources they need to succeed and allow businesses to thrive. It further increases investments in the care infrastructure and it allocates money to modernize our electrical grid and build more resilient transmission lines. This means the ability to power American homes with cheaper, cleaner electricity to help mitigate the effects of climate change. These are just some of the examples of the essential physical and human infrastructure that will create good paying jobs and build an inclusive economy. This is the sort of change that we understand is necessary to ensure that we have an economy that works for everyone businesses big and small, and ensuring that the benefits of these plans are equally shared, as well as the burdens. And that brings me to how we're gonna pay for it. The administration is bringing to the fore a new sensibility around taxation. President Biden is focused on funding these large scale investments by increasing taxes on the corporations who've been invading, uh, evading paying their fair share. In short, we wanna focus on rewarding work not well. The administration is working with the, our partners in the G20 to establish a global minimum corporate tax rate and to eliminate a race to the bottom. So the Biden administration believes that by focusing on getting money to struggling families, bolstering, bolstering the critical care economy, investing in the kinds of infrastructure that will help us survive a changing world and reimagining the way we tax corporations, our government can help families build back better from the crisis. This is a pivot from years of an austerity mentality where government resources were cut and revenues decreased with tax cuts that benefited mostly wealthy families and corporations. Austerity is not the answer. President Biden understands that the kind of legislation he has proposed is a once in a generation opportunity to fundamentally alter American lives for the better. 
I couldn't be prouder to be part of his efforts to make America all it can be for all of its people uh, all across the country. We talk often of returning to normal, but for too many people, the pre-pandemic normal was simply not good enough. We are working hard to create an economy that will work for all Americans, a strong America that can then be a strong ally to our global partners. We, get, we can get to the other side of this pandemic together and build back to a more just society. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Heather. And uh, my takeaway from your contribution is rewarding work, not wealth. Um, that's a, a, a great link to our next speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Annalise Dodds. Uh, Toss in the UK, Annalise needs no uh, introduction really, um, but for everybody else's benefit, uh, she is the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. Annalise, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Gail. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be on this panel with so many fantastic speakers and really wonderful to be talking on this critical issue of the new internationalism that's needed now more than ever. And I really want to start my remarks by paying tribute to the incredible contribution of working people across the world in dealing with this pandemic. I think we've truly learned the meaning of the words public service over the last year. The bravery and dedication shown by key workers has touched our hearts here in the UK and right across the globe. And that's why my party, the Labour Party, has been crystal clear that there can't be any return to the same insecure economy that blighted so many lives before this pandemic. And in the United Kingdom in particular, we must never again have a situation where, for example, frontline workers don't have the equipment they need to stay safe. I have to say it's been disappointing that in the UK, our government has chosen not to reward our key worker heroes with, for example, the pay rises that they deserve to hit people in their pockets with real term pay cuts after all they've done over the last year, really beggars belief. And as the global economy continues to be buffeted by this crisis, we need to see governments coming together to coordinate a global response to protect jobs and incomes and build a stronger, more resilient economy that protects workers' rights and keeps people safe at work. And of course, we also need to heed Heather's calls, which I very much agree with, to value the care economy and to ensure that we improve household incomes, which certainly in the UK have been under pressure for a very long time. I think if there's one thing that the last year has taught us, it's how interdependent and interconnected our world has become. A year ago, as many people on this call will know, the Labour 7 called on the G7 to lead a coordinated response to the spread of the pandemic. Sadly, the G7 response wasn't as strong as it should have been, but it wasn't alone in that. Collectively, international organisations and institutions find it difficult to coordinate in the face of scrambles for resources. And we can see today where that got us, a pandemic that spread to every continent on the planet and a global economy that's under severe pressure as a result. We must learn lessons from the fragmented response to the pandemic and work together to overcome the public health and economic challenges posed by the virus and of course potential future threats from future crises as well, not least the climate and ecological uh, crisis. Now, the first part of the response must be, as Jayati said, the global vaccine rollout. My party has been clear that international leadership and solidarity is needed to make this work. We can't have a repeat of the chaotic scramble for protective equipment and medical supplies that we saw last year and the bidding wars that erupted in the vacuum of global leadership. I'm pleased that the UK is a contributor to the Gavi vaccine initiative, but as Jayati said, we do need to see much more action. We need to see action, for example, to close the funding gaps around access to the COVID-19 accelerator and other initiatives. And those gaps currently amount to about 
22 billion US dollars for 2021. Politicians should be leading the way at the G7 coming up soon to ensure that low and middle income countries get the access that they need. And, you know, Jayati was absolutely right to mention the Oxford vaccine here. It was Oxford University, a public institution, which insisted that its vaccine would be produced at cost price for uh, developing countries into the future and for everyone for as long as the pandemic is in its throes. And it was a partnership between Oxford University and AstraZeneca, but also with our National Health Service, which enabled that vaccine. Nurses who I know, who are my neighbours, working weekend upon weekend to make sure that trial could operate. So we've got to see that partnership into the future. It's the first step towards getting the global economy back on its feet, but we need to be more ambitious as well. And I have to say, you know, Heather's words here really underline the ambitions from the new administration in the United States, especially when it comes to the climate crisis. I've been very clear, this is the make or break decade for reaching net zero. I've called on the UK government to step up in the year that it hosts COP26. My party's put forward proposals to bring forward at least 30 billion pounds in capital spend to support the creation of hundreds of thousands of green jobs, 400,000 well-paid secure new jobs in the clean industries of the future. And yet we see currently in the UK, actually our conservative government cutting back its schemes like the Green Homes Grant, not the leadership we need. We also need, of course, to learn from President Biden's leadership on international tax reform, limiting the ability of huge multinationals to shift profits is hugely welcome and necessary, as is the effort to establish a worldwide minimum tax rate. For too long, tax havens have enabled that kind of profit shifting. A deal on global tax reform is long overdue, and now we need to see governments like the UK's showing leadership as well, moving to support that international effort. And we must also block those illicit financial flows, which quite rightly were discussed in the previous session, which pulls so many uh, resources out of countries that desperately need them. We also, of course, need to prevent the situation currently where some governments are being forced to divert very scarce resources, which should be going into uh, pandemic response and health response, instead going to pay debts to private creditors. That's putting further strain on health systems. It enables higher transmission and further mutations, all of which could set back our global recovery. Again, the UK government must step up to the plate on this, standing up to profiteers, changing the laws that govern debt. And I will continue to insist to the UK Chancellor that he must act. Now, they're just some of the issues that are fundamental to building that new internationalism we need out of this crisis. We've got to remain focused on protecting the world's workers from the effects of this pandemic and securing them a fairer deal. The L7 is absolutely right to highlight the critical importance of social dialogue and collective bargaining and the ILO conventions that underpin workplace democracy. And just to finish off, we've got to remember that ILO, of course, itself was created out of a global crisis in the aftermath of the First World War. Global leaders then recognised the contribution of workers to that effort and acted to protect them after the crisis. Our leaders need to step up and do the same today. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much indeed, Annalise, and thank you very much for your response to Giatti and to Heather. Um, summarised in my mind, partnership and solidarity. And our next speaker knows a thing or two about solidarity. She is Frances O'Grady, um, who is the General Secretary of the UK Trade Union Congress. Francis, you're very welcome. Thanks very much indeed, Gail. And, and just to start by saying, for me, building back better has got to mean building back fairer, uh, just to be really clear about that. And I guess if I was starting with a story that I think sums up uh, some of the struggles we've been having in terms of the international economic system, it would be our recent union-backed victory for Uber drivers, uh, you know, 
people who were ordained to be self-employed because it would strip them of the basic rights that we think all working people deserve, who in their battle uh, included going to the High Court to take on a tech titan um, and win uh, at least the national minimum wage, holiday pay, and that critical right to be accompanied by a trade union representative. And I think that was a blow that we struck against the whole global gig economy model, uh, one that's built on the back of exploitation. And I have to say, uh, there hasn't been too much commentary on this, but when I saw what happened to Deliv Deliveroo when they went public and how it was described as the worst IPO in history, I think it was because some people were having to do their sums and figure out how this model would work if they actually had to pay workers decent wages. Uh, so it's, it's a familiar story um, around the world, I think, because it's based on that basic challenge that we face, that too much power and wealth is concentrated in the hands of too few, that we've seen that rise of surveillance capitalism. You know, we had the global financial crash and now we're seeing the rise of the tech titans, that we've got uh, continued growth of mini jobs and underemployment and rampant insecurity for working people. Um, it's also uh, a global story about the systematic dismantling and shackling of working class institutions, not least trade unions, um, where the playing field is stacked against workers coming together to try and even up that playing field uh, so that we have, if you like, a fair contest to get a fair share of the wealth that workers produce. And it's also been one of a battle of ideas, a, a contested battle, uh, but where without doubt the right has been winning uh, electorally in many countries for the past 40 years. Uh, that idea that private is good, public is bad, so that in the UK, our own prime minister felt bold enough to credit uh, the success of the vaccine rollout to, and I quote, capitalism and greed, rather than, as Annalise has pointed out, uh, to public investment brilliant scientists and our wonderful NHS staff. Um, it's also been one where, at least in the UK, uh, we've seen a government pushing back against that global Black Lives Matters protest um, by trying to pit white working class people against black working class people. I mean, it is pretty gobsmacking in many ways uh, that those uh, champions, if you like, of free marketeer thinking feel empowered to try and divide people in that way. Now, the pandemic obviously poses a, uh, a chance to completely rethink those values, institutions, our mission uh, for our economies globally and domestically. And certainly in the UK, I've been interested that in opinion polls, the economy and health are now joint first as people's concerns, because I think for the first time for many of us, it has been a recognition that you cannot have one without the other. They have become absolutely entwined. And we've seen that re-emergence of value scale, exactly as you spoke about, of solidarity, of collectivism, of community, of caring about your neighbour as well as your own family. Um, and appreciation of key workers. As I've often said, people weren't out on the steps clapping hedge fund managers and private equity partners. They were clapping workers, key workers, uh, health and social care, posters, transport, you name it, for the work that they do for all of us. Um, but we have seen those inequalities exposed and exacerbated like never before. And perhaps again, the image that will always stay with me is social care workers on less than £10 an hour scrabbling 
for basic PPE to protect themselves uh, to do the job they do for all of us. The only thing I would caution when we think about this possibility of change is uh, that we should not be complacent. You know, after the global financial crash, I remember many of us believing that this was a crossroads, that, you know, we couldn't carry on as we were. It couldn't be back to business as usual. Everybody had seen that it was simply not right that workers should pay the price for a crash uh, in which, frankly, some very wealthy individuals and, and banks were the villains. Uh, but actually what we saw was many governments choosing to impose austerity, uh, an active political choice, which again, some international institutions have now acknowledged was even in its own terms, the wrong thing to do because it sucked demand out of the economy at the very time when it needed it most. Um, and even as this, you know, even as we continue to be in the midst of this pandemic, let's not forget that currently we see pictures of David Cameron uh, with senior people at Greensill, get rich quick merchants, basically, um, who have co-opted politicians for their own ends and for their own uh, shared enrichment. So, is this a 1945 moment? I sincerely hope so, but I don't think we should rest on our laurels and bank on it. Um, certainly one big change is the election of President Biden setting up that blueprint for an alternative. Uh, I'm hoping and lighting the candles that we'll see a few more of those strong men fall. Let's hope Brazil is next and a, a few others around the world. But I think it is important that we set out a vision and a practical programme for change. And certainly uh, from, for our part at the TUC, we want to see that new internationalism. That has to be about a rejection of vaccine nationalism. That's an urgent um, need. And certainly within the WTO, uh, we need to be lobbying our own governments to give poorer countries the chance and the intellectual property to produce vaccines locally. That is absolutely urgent, and I agree with that. Um, but we also need that mission of full employment, a noble but practical aim based on good green investment and jobs and dignity at work and when we talk about just transition i wish sometimes we also need to listen you know telling people that for the good of the planet sorry you're going to lose your livelihood uh is it isn't going to cut it in my experience and i in most cases in fact we're talking about changing firms and changing jobs not replacing them you know diversification should be an important part of this story and it's certainly not good enough to tell people don't worry we'll retrain you you know when people are scared about their jobs we've got to offer people a bit more of a green guarantee than that um i think we also need a clear recognition that economic strength depends on social resilience and resilience in our health and social care services um, the uh, fragility of global supply chains has been exposed uh, but so has the strength of our uh, public services and welfare systems and we need to fix those so there is a vital role for public investment and indeed public ownership we need fair rules to distribute wealth tax is critical in that but so is uh, the conversation that the TUC is trying to be trying to launch uh, at home, but also internationally about how we share the benefits of new technologies like AI that promise to boost productivity to the value in multi millions. We need a clear and open and transparent conversation about how workers get a fair share of the benefits and how society uh, can be uh, benefit from that too. And finally, of course, we need institutional reform. I'm, I'm not naive on this until we get 
uh, political change in many of the countries that make up those institutions, we will end up with appointments um, uh, to lead them, for example, that would not be our choice. Uh, you know, that, that requires, we've got to win elections. But when we talk about institutions, let's also remember that we need to reform our own. Trade unions have to be fit for the digital age. They have to be fit for 21st century workers and the 21st century working class, which is black and white, women and men, young and old, uh, digi savvy and those who are still learning. We have got to not just serve up the same old offer we have got to move with the times too because i think there in the end there is no substitute for building the global trade union movement bigger smarter and determined to win thank you gail and thank you very much francis and you can always be relied on to remind us not to rest on our laurels <laughs> um, we'll take that to heart um, and our last speaker but by no means least uh, is Pierre Habard, and Pierre is the General Secretary of the Trade mm -hmm. Advisory Committee to the OECD. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity and my team to contribute to this uh, uh, to this workshop by the TUC. The TUC has, uh, if I may, within the labour movement, stands a bit uh, uh, up, up, the up front in spearheading the, uh, the labour movement uh, thinking. Uh, as Francis mentioned, uh, we should not waste a crisis, I think. We should, uh, to the extent possible, take the opportunity of the pandemic to, to rethink our model of crisis. But as Francis said, in a sense, we've been through it before. In 2008, 2009, many of us were there already, uh, and, we, and we wanted to change that model of growth. Your predecessor, Francis, uh, John Monks, was uh, at the time General Secretary of the ETUC, the European Trading Confederation, and he himself already was there, along uh, raising the bell uh, on, the, uh, on the model of crisis. It's a difficult period because it's difficult to disentangle uh, emergency measures that government are taking from the more long-term uh, perspective. Our economies are still in intensive care units. Uh, people are, That's, this is what matters, but most of our economy are still in intensive care units. Uh, the Biden administration uh, stimulus package is of course most welcome. We should know from a European perspective that it's a lot part of that money in Europe actually is something that is uh, delivered on a, on a daily basis to people through automatic stabilizers, through strong social safety nets. So the issue is here is, and as Francis mentioned and, uh, and others, once we go somewhere down the road of the crisis, will it be a back to normal? Is it building back better, but within the same normality or are we going indeed to, to have a process, a, 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 a process that can change the model. I, I listened carefully to the very first session here uh, uh, because I was there and I listened to Matthew Klein and Petit Fort and, uh, uh, and Jeff Tidy. Uh, they brought us to, to us, uh, you know, the concern about this dead end that we have with export led debt fueled growth. Matthew Klein uh, highlighting the case of China, which is not only compressing households, it is oppressing people. It is an uh, 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 petit for bringing the illusion of, of, of this consumer welfare anti economy. And, uh, and Jeff Tidy with this very telling graph showing how the, the G7 economy, the growth of the G7 economy, has been falling little by little, but surely over the last 10, 15 years. Not because they haven't delivered on the exports per front, but because of compressed domestic demand. And uh, as Francis uh, uh, finished, but also Richard Tronka at the opening, I think both brought back this issue of how can we rebuild our democratic institutions. Uh, if we want to change model, we need indeed an army of experts, we need an army of, of, of economies, but we need <laughs> to rebuild our democracies because we are facing very powerful uh, corporate power, uh, policy, uh, which is generating policy capture. So what can we do from there? Uh, I'm a, in a, not necessarily in a difficult position, but it is a job of my institution there, the, uh, the TUAC, Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD to, to, to participate to this push, to shift the center of gravity of the policy thinking 
uh, in international organization. Uh, so our, uh, there is the OECD. Uh, there is a G7, which is not a stable organization, but it is a forum. There is also the, uh, the G20. It's the role of the labor movement to occupy the field, so to speak, to be there and to push for change. Uh, it matters, it matters in its own. It is a difficult period right now uh, because let's say that multilateralism is not in the best shape. Uh, of course, there is a change of, of uh, administration in the United States, but it would be a bit too easy to, to put all the blame on the previous administration for the failure of, a, of, a, of a multilateralism. Uh, but much remains to be done, obviously. Uh, I can tell with an organization like the OECD, which, as you will know, how now has a is uh, has a change of leadership with a new incoming general secretary. Uh, you can see that every time there's a crisis, there's progress. Little by little people realize, okay, this model uh, 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 of growth, this neoliberal model based uh, um, on exports, it's not delivering. It's becoming more and more unstable with the frequency uh, of the crisis. But we are not there yet with a, a, uh, a serious questioning. It's much about changing the things at the margin changing the things, indeed, much needed things such as better access to skills, indeed, better access to safety nets. But we are not there really. There is, uh, in those institutions, the OECD, the IMF, I guess, the World Bank, the IFS, there is still much, obviously, um, to be done. What, what, what can we do and what have uh, the TRUAC and the ITC um, uh, been discussing together with key trade union centers and the TUC has been playing a key role uh, 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 in helping us shaping our uh, uh, our policy discussion, I think what uh, uh, we can bring back the discussion on what are we aiming at. That's an obvious to say, uh, but to contest this export-led model, focus on solvent domestic-led growth, sustainable growth, climate-oriented, but solvent domestic-led uh, growth. Uh, where the trade and global investment can play a role, clearly, uh, but one that is adjusting, that is not at the center, the one that is complementary uh, to, uh, to the engine. I won't repeat what uh, other speakers have said, and for sure much better than, than my French uh, Euro-English, but uh, there is, we know more or less where, where we want to go, policy coherence between the trade, the labor, the environmental system. Uh, resolve this mismatch that we observed with financialization of the economy and now with digitalization, uh, which are actually very two similar uh, wave. Every time there is a technological gap, uh, there is a regulatory gap that appears that, that needs um, uh, to be uh, plugged. Be much more serious about the coordination of, of fiscal and monetary uh, policy, starting with the mandates that we are giving to the central banks and the accountability uh, of the central banks. Uh, and then obviously domestically we know and uh, uh, there, uh, we need to, I hate to, to use this word that we need because obviously you know, it's, it's easier said than done, but it is important that we reverse this in, constant individualization of risk on the labor markets and this transfer of risk from employers uh, onto workers. Um, uh, that's, I guess, uh, bring back the discussion on labor market institutions, robot la uh, labor market uh, uh, institutions. And then from there, uh, so um, uh, I guess in the short term, let's make best use, if we can, of forums like the G7 and the G20. The issue is not to give more legitimacy than, than needed to these forums, it's to make best use of them. Uh, there is a, a common ground. I'll come back to the very initial opening and what uh, Jeff uh, Tidy was saying is, yes, we should give more life to this notion of internationalism, a, uh, a uh, internationalism on labor terms. Uh, so let's uh, bring back this narrative to those forums, to those institutions, G20, G7, uh, uh, the, United uh, the United Nations, uh, the International Finance Institution, as well as um, the OECD, as I mentioned. Uh, so thanks again for the conversation. There will, of course, be a follow-up at our end. Uh, thanks for that. Over to you, Jane. And thank you very much indeed, Pierre. You mentioned uh, domestic-led growth, and uh, Frances touched on her vision of uh, uh, greening our uh, environment and economy. 
But one of the questions uh, by, um, put by Constantine is really uh, challenging the impact of transformation to a green economy. Um, Constantine asks, well, isn't this going to result in higher unemployment? And um, if it did, do we not need to strengthen the social safety net? Annalise, have you a view on that? And then I'll come to Francis. Yeah, that, thanks very much, Gail. And I think actually in Francis's remarks, she really faced up to this because we hear a lot of rhetoric around um, the just transition, but there are fewer examples where we genuinely have seen industrial change that has been positive for workers and where we haven't seen people being left behind. I do think there are some examples where we've seen positive change, but there are many, many fewer than examples of deindustrialization, job loss, and then the only new jobs coming in being actually very low paid, low terms and conditions jobs. So we, I think, um, you know, across the labor movement need to work far harder on this. I think there are very big questions for us around skills development and training where there will be new opportunities because of digitalization, but new challenges as well as a result of it. I think there are many big questions about um, gender in this regard, where very often the kind of image of an inverted commas green jobs that people may have may feel very far away from many women's experience, particularly young women. And where I think a lot of the time we forget that, for example, jobs in the caring professions are green jobs, they're low carbon jobs and where we need to see you know, far better terms, conditions and wages. So a lot of work to be done I would say in this regard. And you know, the more we can do on this together, the better. Thanks very much. And Francis, is there anything you'd like to add to your earlier comments? I mean, that's certainly comments that resonate with uh, members in my union. Well, the, the TUC set out for not too long ago, a very practical plan for creating over a million new green jobs in the parts of the country that need them. We weren't pulling figures out of the air. We did a lot of detailed work on where and how, recognising that we need job creation quickly, as well as defending jobs through furlough. We actually, particularly for young workers, need to create some big numbers where they're needed most in green tech and transport infrastructure and so on. So, I, and I think we can learn a lot from the Biden plan on this too. But I guess I just wanted to underline that warning you know that there can be a certain fatigue in the trade union movement that we hear lots of big numbers and it's all about new jobs actually the big challenge is transforming the jobs that we have and transforming the firms that we have um, in order to guarantee a future for those livelihoods and businesses. Uh, so I think we need a little more conversation about that. Again, the TUC a while ago now produced a report looking at some of the good examples around the world of where this had been done in a way that we thought was right. Um, but we're doing more work on that now because, like I said, I just don't think it's good enough to kind of offer a promise. I think people, you know, when it's when it's our jobs on the line, we all want a few more hard details than that. Um, and so we need to be able to show people really good examples of how this can work to everybody's benefit. Because without doubt, working people have an interest in cutting carbon as much as anybody else. Uh, but we've got to do it in a way that is pro-worker and unapologetically so. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to Pierre because I've got um, unfairly two questions for Heather. Uh, so Pierre, are you advising the OECD on decent work uh, and bringing workers with us in this transition to a green economy? Yes, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that's obviously a priority for the labour movement, uh, especially with a, an organisation like the OECD, which is perhaps the less known about, among the, the most important organisations. The OECD is, a, is, a, is an organisation that the whispers at the ears of many policymakers. So, uh, so yes, that, that's, a, that's a key priority. Uh, what we try to, uh, to bring, uh, uh, we, we bring the evidence about strong labour market institutions. It is about decent work in the highest sense of the world. 
of the world clearly. Uh, but but, uh, but beyond that, it's about how do you organize labor market around strong institutions, so minimum floors, obviously, and also coordinated um, bar, uh, bargaining at firm and sector wide level. So we made some progress uh, on that front. Uh, and clearly, uh, but for an organization like the OEC, what matters is also to connect the dots. So indeed, with the climate change, but also with competition, uh, you can do a lot with protecting workers' bargaining power <laughs> uh, with labor market institution. But when you are facing a private monopoly like the large systemic size digital institutions, the answer is also in, in competition in antitrust uh, policies as well as with tax and so on. So the question is, how also do you connect the dot between labor market reform, competition, tax? It was mentioned, and so on. And this is where obviously things uh, become a bit more complicated. It's important for the labor movement. Uh, not to be put into a corner. <laughs> we have we have something to say on competition. Obviously, on trade, we uh, and the TUC have been uh, uh, doing uh, uh, has some great leadership on that front. Uh, on data, data privacy, artificial in intelligence, we have a voice in every seat that matters when it comes to sustainable growth. Thanks very much. And and Heather, you know, coal, steel, gas, the union jobs on union rates. Um, how, how do you imagine the Biden administration is going to um, take workers with it on this uh, transition to the green economy? Well, I mean, I can't stress how important it is. I mean, how important this conversation we're having today um, and how important that we bring everyone along. Um, you know, we do have to think about this as it, this is an enormous economic transformation, just to go back to the climate point, right? We, we know that climate change is happening. We know that it changes the way that we need to produce things. Um, and that, um, that, that in that transformation, uh, there's going to be, um, uh, if it's not managed well, it will not necessarily be good for workers and communities across the country. And so as we laid out the American Jobs Plan, making sure that this transformation, this transition to a different, to a cleaner energy economy is being managed well is, is a core part of the goal. So making those big upfront investments uh, that we need to make in the sectors that are really important, um, you know, making sure that we are focused on the kinds of industries that are gonna create good jobs across our economy, our society. And then of course, pairing it with, um, you know, a, a part of the package is um, what we call in the United States, the PRO Act, which would give workers greater latitude in um, being able to do collective bargaining. Um, you know, whether or not all those pieces make it through the congressional process is still, you know, being negotiated right, you know, down the street. But, um, but that was a core part of our thinking is that you have to pair those two. And I mean, I wanna underscore, I mean, so many things have been said, but you know, one thing that, that Francis said that, you know, you have to be thinking about the jobs that are here and the jobs that are gonna be created and how to make sure that those jobs that are being created are created all across your economy and society and that we're um, making good jobs out of the ones that are here. Um, and that's also why there's been such an emphasis on the care infrastructure, the human infrastructure pieces. These are jobs that so far robots can't do. They're very difficult to outsource, um, but you know, they are among the worst paid jobs in our economy, you know, jobs for, um, caring for the aging and the disabled, caring for young children or you know, pre-K. Um, and so unless we make those good jobs and again, give those workers the right to collectively bargain, um, then, then we're not gonna really have this effective transition to this new kind of economy. So you know, it's about really kind of identifying the places where we cannot allow markets to do the work of governing and to focus on what is in the national interest, what's in the interest of communities and making sure that we're Helping to, to push the economy in that direction, and um, you know, and and while doing so, making sure that everyone benefits. I mean, I want to underscore that I'm pointing to your boxes. Of course, that's silly because we're on Zoom. Um, that the thing that Pierre said about um, competition could not be more important. You know, one of the things that scholars in the United States have been documenting is that we've been seeing less investment here because of the rise in concentration. So that clearly affects workers in their communities. It affects what kinds of jobs are being created, what kind of investment is being done. Um, and with very low interest rates, this is the moment for government to invest, um, both because of climate change and because of you know, what we've learned from the pandemic and the crisis, and because the private sector isn't doing it at the scale and scope and with the focus that we need uh, for this new transition. Thank you, Heather, and you've um, talked yourself into another question. Um, 
Um, Stephen asks, well, isn't it the case that President Biden, I'm paraphrasing, you put it much more academically, but anyway, um, isn't uh, President Biden's infrastructure uh, uh, just going to line capital's pockets or will the infra be owned by the public? That's a great question. Um, certainly here in the United States, there's a lot of belief in the free market. Um, so, you know, the, the packages and the plans, um, it, you know, quite frankly, include some of both and some attention to what that means for consumers and for people. So just, you know, one example, the um, uh, one of the commitments is to make sure that broadband reaches every family um, at, you know, a set minimum speed, um, along with a commitment to making sure that we address the competition issues there. The United States consumer pays more for broadband than, than those of you in other countries. Um, uh, and a lot of that does have to do with the monopoly structure of that industry and the lack of um, options. And so uh, looking at those, you know, what we economists would call rents and trying to make sure that that market works effectively is, you know, is, is one of the things that's written into that, that plan. Thank you very much, Heather. We're running out of time. So um, if you'll bear with me, if I could ask Pierre, Annelise, uh, then Francis, you know, one takeaway from this session, we've had a takeaway, which is a call to arms, really, a call to action um, from uh, Jayati. Um, Pierre, in one sentence, one 30 second sentence, what's your takeaway? He's frozen. Oh no, yeah, Pierre. <laughs> Sorry. Um... 30 seconds. Let's avoid, I mean, a hope, a hope that this is not, how you call it in English, Groundhog Day, like, you know, repetition, you know, uh, again, and I, I want to bring the, uh, the fundamental issue for us is, uh, and it was brought back again uh, early on, can we tolerate, can we continue to tolerate that level of inequality um, uh, in some countries, perhaps to start with in the United States. So where, where the breaking point? So I would hope, just to hope that the, uh, this, uh, this uh, will be a, a, a discussion that can, okay, say lead to action. I don't know how to put that. Uh, uh, what is sure is that we'll do our best uh, at the, uh, uh, within the labor movement. We will work with national centers. Thank you, we've got the drift. Um, Annelise, can you manage in 30 seconds? I'll certainly try um, and it's been a fantastic discussion. I think the main thing it's underlined to me is that in building back better so much of the discussion is very abstract and doesn't actually focus on the workforce who will be doing the building in the first place. So unless we have that focus on working people on their terms, conditions, pay and circumstances, we won't be getting our economy to that more secure, stronger place across all the countries that we're representing here and that are represented in this conference. Thank you very much. Um, Francis, uh, last word. Well, I'd, needless to say, I agree with um, everyone. I think uh, we have an opportunity here to create a whole new legion of champions for a greener, fairer economy. But we have to do that by building organized labor. That's, you know, in the end, it seems to me that this is a contest. Uh, we've got the best ideas. We've got incredible people within our ranks, but we need more of them to win. Thank you very much. And um, we've, uh, we, we've hit the deadline almost. Um, uh, in the chat, uh, Jeff Tilly, who's done a lot of work uh, for this, has thanked our panel, but let me uh, amplify my, uh, my appreciation. It's been a brilliant panel. There's been fantastic practical ideas and some warnings um, about the risks of not bringing our people with us. Um, it's wonderful to have uh, the uh, US uh, perspective uh, and to hear from Pierre in the role that he's playing and of course Annalise giving us a tantalizing flavor of what we might have uh, if we had a Labour government so um, we've got elections in May let's all uh, pull together and see what we can uh, do uh, in support of uh, those elections so um, and Francis um, we are not going to rest on our laurels that's going to be my <laughs> no resting on laurels so thanks to everybody and to all the people that have made today possible, the TUC team and the technical team. 
Um, thanks for your contributions uh, and there's a lot of work to do. Thank you.